recording is now started. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the Dallas Personal Robotics Group uh, February 13th monthly meeting. Today we have a special focus on outdoor rovers uh, with a kind of a panel discussion from some experienced builders. Uh, my name is Carl Ott, I'm the current president of DPRG and I'll serve as moderator, moderator today. Uh, we do have a lot of people on the line, a little more than normal, so I think everybody's already muted, so hats off to your uh, Zoom behavior uh, and online. That'll be helpful um, as we manage this discussion to keep the audio manageable. Um, so briefly, for those that aren't familiar, oops, just to click on the right slide. Uh, DPRG has been around since 1984. It's a... 501c kind of organization. We meet every Tuesday night, Dallas time, and the second Saturday of every month. And we just like to build and putz around and compete with uh, robots. We do a little community outreach, STEM for all ages. We like programming and building and sensors and basically cool things in that space. We do have uh, uh, costs, uh, minor costs to keep the thing, keep the lights on. So we, uh, we do collect dues from the most regular members, and uh, we also have some sponsors. So a shout out and thank you to uh, Mauser, Plolu, Vex, Rev, and uh, others. Today, uh, we'll just do a brief touch base on housekeeping, and then we'll spend most of the time on, on our panel, uh, building builders panel. Um, and then any other follow-up we can do at the end. Uh, for the brief housekeeping, so just an upcoming calendar. Uh, today's our panel discussion. Kareem, if uh, fingers crossed and the competition schedules align, we still have you penciled in for the next month uh, presentation. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Iron Rain, this is an award-winning, really awesome team. Kareem has shepherded over many years in Dallas of high schoolers. Um, and then uh, April through July, we intend to have, uh, well, every month we have presentations on one topic or another. We're, we're trying to focus them a little bit uh, this year on outdoor rovers, try and build up some interest uh, so that by uh, August 14, we can actually get back together again after the COVID thing and have an outdoor competition. Um, by uh, my baseline where we would normally use a DPRG has a contest called the Robo Columbus Plus. Uh, we can put the, oops, we can put the, the links here into the chat for those not familiar with it, if I could copy paste. And then uh, we already have a thank you, Dave, ahead of time. David has uh, offered to do a, a kind of drill down into how to navigate without building a map. Uh, uh, actually, it's a presentation he's given to SRS before in Seattle. So uh, we're looking forward to David dust, dusting that off and uh, and sharing it again here more recently. Um, and with that in mind, are there any other topics uh, anybody thinks we ought to add to the list at this point? Okay, great. Hearing none. All right. So outdoor rovers, why today? Well, uh, we've been stuck inside for the last year. And we've uh, had a lot of focus on indoor rovers and simulators. And I think we're uh, all, many of us are itching to get our hands dirty. And if that means running robots around in the sand and the mud, then so be it. Let's go, let's go outside and do something fun. Um, and the thought is that there's enough interest around the table, uh, people that wouldn't consider themselves experienced builders that, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could come up with topics and presenters to drill down to as we uh, build excitement around this, uh, try and get some people interested in building rovers. And uh, I'm not sure how we'll handle with the uh, remote uh, competitors and interest we've gotten in the last year, but uh, let's see if we can't figure out a way to, uh, to serve our, our interested members and parties from outside Dallas in August. And with that, uh, on our builder panel today, uh, we'll follow a pretty simple agenda. Uh, first, we'll have three or four minutes for each panelist, and they'll give an intro about themselves, their uh, robot, uh, what's unique about it, what's cool about it, what they want to boast about. Excuse me, here's somebody joining. 
Um, then we have, uh, it somehow ballooned a little bit beyond 10 questions. And because of the number of questions and the uh, number of people online and our uh, proven tendency to uh, drill down into every nook and cranny of every rabbit hole, uh, I'm going to try and uh, moderate things so that we can get through these 10-ish questions in about two hours, unless people really want to stretch it out longer. Um, we'll have Q&A throughout, uh, but then we can definitely have some time after the questions as well. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And in no particular order, it's just how I happen to type in one the slide. I'd like to introduce uh, David Anderson, Scott Gibson, Kareem Varani, and Jesse Brockman. Uh, the first three are uh, current uh, members of DPRG. And Jesse, thank you for uh, joining as a guest uh, as a Spark Fund ambassador and participated in our fall uh, line following simulator. So contest, very cool. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is uh, if we could go in this order, that'd be, and I wouldn't have to change the slide. So, uh, Mr. Anderson, by any chance, could I relinquish the screen and let you present three or four minutes of introduction? And you're muted. And we all have to learn to, how to read lips. You're still muted. Okay. No, that's not true. I'm, I'm just doing that to mess with you. <laughs> three or four minutes is, is just not long enough. Uh, my robot, uh, my outdoor robot, I've only ever built one, uh, is JBot, and I'm going to put the uh, link to uh, its uh, URL homepage in the uh, chat, uh, which uh, will be a point we can uh, refer to. And then I also have JBot himself right here. Let's see. Can anybody see a robot? Uh, part of a robot. There's one. It's looking good. Uh, and this is a six-wheel off-road robot. It has independent suspension on all six wheels. And the three wheels on each side are driven by a single motor. Uh, here you can see the motor uh, that drives the right side. And it has an encoder on the back of it. So that's the basic machine. There's two motors with encoders and uh, independent suspension uh, for a six wheel drive. Uh, the sensors on this, basically there's only a couple of sensors. Uh, if you can see the top of this, let's see if I can kick this up. Uh, yeah, there's the, uh, uh, the UPS, I'm sorry, uh, the IMU is uh, inside that little white box there and then you can see uh, that there is a camera here. This is kind of hard to see. Maybe I can tip the tip my camera off. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's the uh, IMU, and this is the camera, uh, which is mounted on a on a rotating and a swiveling mount. And then uh, let me see here. Uh, this is a uh, an array of uh, Four sonar that are arranged at 15 degree intervals. They each have a beam width of about 50 degrees, so that gives me about uh, 60 degrees total. Uh, and they're mounted here rather high uh, because the philosophy on this robot was that you should be able to drive over anything you can't sense. <laughs> and uh, so, on an outdoor robot, and we can back to this. On an outdoor robot, what, what is an obstacle becomes a more complicated question. On an indoor robot, an obstacle is basically anything that's not sitting on the floor. But on an outdoor robot, you go through, you know, you climb over rocks and you go through holes and so forth and so forth. What, what represents a, an obstacle is not uh, as obvious. And while I've got it here, I want to show you one little cool thing I got working just a few years ago, which has turned out to be really useful. Uh, man, i got to reset. Hang on. There we go. Uh, this, uh, this box here that contains the sonar, uh, what I found was that if I was going down a real steep hill, when I got to the bottom of the hill, it saw the ground as an obstacle. 
And so what I did was I added a servo to this. Because I have an IMU, I know how level the robot is. And so as the robot, let's see if you can see this. No, you can't. How about like this? There we go. Okay, so as the robot tips downhill, you can see that the, the sonar array tries to maintain parallel to the horizon. In fact, the camera does the same thing. I don't know if you can see the camera. And the camera actually does it in two axes. Uh, so this is the camera here. And I don't know if you can see it is also uh, maintaining uh, square with the horizon. And I think that's about three or four minutes. So, uh, Carl, is that enough? I admitted myself. I think that's a... A pretty good overview. I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunity to dive back in uh, as we go through these questions. But as a high-level overview, that's that sounds really good. Thank you. And the link uh, you provided in in the chat for everybody. So uh, that would be great. Okay. So oh, one other question I should ask. So David, when did you start that robot? How long have you been working on it? Uh, Mike Hamilton, who was a designer for Traxxas that built the radio control uh, cars, uh, and I got fascinated by the DARPA Grand Challenge. And uh, that was, I believe, in 2006. Does that sound right? And uh, <clears throat> so we wanted to build a miniature version, which we thought we could actually scale up uh, to actually enter the DARPA Grand Challenge. I wish we had entered the scaled down version one the first year because it would have made it further than any of the others. <laughs> uh, but a, a larger one was never built, and uh, and it turned out to be such a fun little robot that uh, that that initial was abandoned. And then Mike, the designer, passed away a few years ago, and um, <clears throat> so that basically was the end of that project. Um, is it is that what you need? Thank you. Cool. So you've been working on that one for a while. It might only be your first and only, but you've been you've been after it. So that's good. Well, I haven't worked on it, you know, in many years. Uh, last year, I started the, to port uh, it to a new microprocessor, to a STM32 Nucleo, an ARM microprocessor. I had the port completed, but boy, you got to move a lot of wires to change microprocessors, and I haven't gotten up the nerve to do it yet. Okay, thanks. All right, next up, Scott Gibson. Can you give a three or four minute uh, ish introduction? Sure. I've got a little um, got a little presentation here. Let me get it going. Can you see that? Um, we see Not you. Yet. With the background, no presentation yet. Uh, okay. Now it's coming up. There we go. We'll get this technology thing figured out sooner or later. Looking good. All right. All right, so just here's a quick overview flowchart of um, BURP, which stands for Big Ugly Robot Project. I originally started this as kind of just a hack. Um, there was a lot of materials left over from work, um, and I said, well, let me see what I can do with them. So I just started throwing together a robot, and, you know, robots aren't built, they evolve, right? So this has gone through a lot of different iterations, and uh, enhancements. Uh, ho hopefully, you could call it enhancements. Um, but I make extensive use of distributed processing. So all of my main CPU board here, this is all, and, and keep in mind, all of these boards here I've designed and built myself. They run on um, a Cortex M3, um, the LPC 1769 platform. Um, and they communicate over a CAN bus right here. So my main CPU just talks to the H bridges that drive the left and right motor um, uh, through the CAN bus. And then my sensor array is not too much unlike David's, where I have sonars, except for I have five of them. They are on a tilt assembly. Um, 
And for our Robo Columbus um, contest, you have to, you're supposed to touch the cone, but not move it. So I have a bumper that's more for touching the cone, knowing when I touch the cone than really avoiding um, any obstacles, because hopefully I won't get that close. And of course the Pixie Cam, um, which does the cone recognition. Um, GPS in the AHARS unit, which is basically the altitude heading reference system, um, which is the IMU, but it's three dimensional, right? So you have altitude and heading. Um, and then one of the things in, that I'll it maybe expand more in the gotchas is, um, and David can attest to this, is when you're debugging these, um, and you saw how David was dragging his across the floor. These are not really lightweight robots, right? So when you when it breaks down or it stops in the middle of the yard, and you have to walk over and grab it and carry it back. Um, I got really tired of that. So I built a little remote control setup um, out of an old RC controller and some Bluetooth radios I had um, so I can drive it around without having to pick it up. And then also have a a 900 megahertz, um, it's a Lynx radio that I transmit telemetry over to a PC app that I have written. Um, and I can actually record the run so I can go back and single step through it. And that's been very, very helpful for debugging. Because like I said, debugging these can be a real, um, real challenge. So here's some pictures of it. Um, you'll see the, the sonar array, and it's on a tilt assembly. Um, the I, the AHARS unit is up here, and this is all, and I stole this straight from David. I used some plumbing parts, you know, to keep it non-metallic, and um, uh, so it didn't uh, alter the IMU. And you'll notice, too, that, and David, you, you're talking about you haven't got brave enough to move all the wires yet. Well, if you'll look, these, this is all the wires that go to my main CPU. So I have power and a CAN bus. And then this is actually the IMU uh, or the AHARS wiring. And there's a better picture of that here in a little bit. But um, so it's um, like a backwards trike, if you will, and a differential steering. Here's the underside. And these motors are probably several times more than are needed. Um, this is what I was able to get at Tanner. Um, they have Scott, really I think, nice... you're, I think your your slides aren't advancing. No, they're not. No. I think you're you're showing us the presenter's view and not the actual slideshow. Yeah. So we've been stuck on the same slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned it earlier. Sorry about that. You should probably just stick with the presenter's view and just scroll and then advance. Okay. All right, hang on. There you go. Can you see it now? Yep. Uh, yeah, we got your got your mouse cursor too. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you not see? No my mouse. Yeah, yeah, that's good to show that we haven't seen that. Great. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Well, then I guess I'll I'll try to speed it up. So this is what I was referring to. I'm sorry, someone um, didn't say something sooner. Um, so you have the CAN bus, you have your two H bridges for the left and right motors, um, the sensors, um, the tilt and pan, um, sonar array, and here's the remote control I was talking about, um, and then the telemetry link that, and this radio is a, a high-powered radio. It's rated for over a mile in line of sight. So um, it's been, I can't stress enough how helpful having live telemetry to a ground, basically like a ground station um, can be. So here's the pictures I was trying to show you with the sonar array, the IMU or AHARS up here, um, and some more pictures here. Showing, and then here's my Pixie Cam, and I have it fixed. I was thinking about mounting it in this panel here that tilts. Um, but I only use it for identifying the cones. Um, so there was really no need to raise it up. And, and like David, I, this is tied into my IME or my AHARS, so I can adjust it as the tilt of the robot um, you know, goes up and down. 
Um, also, the other thing I found is since the cone of the sonars, you know, is, is fairly large, even 15 degrees, um, it's very easy to pick up um, the grass leaves. So if, if the grass hadn't been mowed or there's high weeds, um, I can also adjust the, the offset to try to compensate for not triggering on, um, on higher grass. Um, Here's the bottom side I was trying to show you that um, these motors were some we got from Tanner Electronics was surplus place here um, in the Dallas area or was um, much larger motor than actually is needed. Um, and I even had some planetary gearboxes that I mounted to it to uh, reduce the speed because these were, I think, four or five thousand RPM motors. Um, so this is all hand built as well. Um, so this is, this is my main CPU here and, and, you know, David, like I was saying, you know, you're talking about all the wires that you'd have to change. Well, there's only, I think there's only six or eight wires here, um, for the whole interface. And that's one of the great things about a CAN bus is, you know, you have two wires and you can just move a ton of data over it. Um, I run my bus at 125 kilohertz. Um, so it's, it, it does quite well. Um, here's the interior of it. May I jump in with a statement? Sure. Excuse me. Uh, Scott gave us a presentation on the CAN bus uh, last year, and it's something he uses professionally. Every microprocessor I've looked at since then, I noticed does have a CAN bus interface. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more efficient than, um, you know, wiring up individual pins. Um, it takes a little bit more programming because now, okay, if I'm going to send a message from one board, I have to, re you know, know what to do with it on the other side. Um, but it really cleans up the hardware side and, you know, the wiring. And, and we've all been in contests where it's like people say, oh, a wire fell off or I think something came loose. Um, so, you know, it can be uh, you know, a matter of reliability as well. Um, to try to keep the, the hardware as simple as possible um, as far as the connections and the wiring and, um, and that sort of thing. So that's, um, that's BURP in a nutshell. And Very I'm cool. Sure there'll be more questions. There, there are certainly 10-ish or more questions in there that are coming. <laughs> Actually, I should, have, I should have warned the presenters. I shared a question list with them about an hour and a half ago and and then about 30 minutes ago a bunch more questions got onto it so we're we're overloaded in questions uh, but thank you scott good intro all right so let's move on next in line would be kareem the screen is yours uh, sorry i missed the questions uh question updates so um i haven't been meeting all day update. long but uh i'm yeah. going to go ahead and post a link to the, sh the page i'm going to show you don't really need to start scrolling through it yet. I'm going to go ahead and uh, present that page. And it's really just a bunch of videos. Um, so um, I'm, I'll try to like just skip through them um, and uh, and not show the whole things. But uh, Carl, feel free to you know cut me off when, if I'm running long because okay. um, there's a bit more than, than I was expecting. We can come back to it if people are interested. Cool. So uh, I do consider it dabbling, this, which isn't to say that I don't do a lot of dabbling, um, but it's not, uh, you know, my, my standards are a lot lower um, than David's and Scott's. So in terms of what, what I actually accomplish with it, um, just uh, it, it does go a ways back. So I don't have a photo or video of Grishnak, but that was like um, a rocker bogey that was inspired by the first Mars rovers. Um, I'm tagging it as a 2005 time frame, maybe, but uh, it was probably a bit earlier than that. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, it had some very basic vision, but it was a rocker bogey, and I'm just putting it in there to tie it sort of to the, the rover that's about to land uh, on Mars, as well as um, uh, uh, that, you know, ex marginal experience with that kind of drivetrain. Um, this is a uh, project, Minion was a project that um, uh, I, I had my middle school team do. Um, and this was basically the first time we started using a rock crawler 
um, and uh, it had a NXT Mindstorms uh, controller on it. Um, and it had a phone mounted just to create a user interface for folks. Um, so I'm going to show that real briefly. So uh, let me know if you guys actually get this video. Yes. So you can come back to that if you if you're interested. But that was sort of a setup for the first time we started experimenting with a, a rock crawler base. And this video doesn't show it, but we we did use it outdoors. The whole purpose was to be a um, a walking companion for um, nursing home residents, um, and uh, and it's just steered by the leash and it has an ultrasonic sensor to avoid bumping into things. But um, pretty basic. I think I still have it around here somewhere, but I haven't seen it since the move. Um, so, uh, but that led into Argos, um, and uh, this is basic. This is a larger, like a fifth scale uh, type rock crawler. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, these videos, if you want to come back in later, will sort of explain in more detail how it was constructed, what the thinking was like. Um, but this is basically just following this visual target right here. Do you actually see my cursor? Oh yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. Cool. The desired speed is based on the area of the current largest oh. blob. We take the square. I'm going to mute it so that you can um, and just talk over it. But uh, there is onboard um, and uh, what do you call it? Voiceover. Um, so here it's tracking that that orange 3D printed target. Um, it is an Android operating system running on the phone. This is an earlier iteration of it where the low level control, um, the Android phone was sort of running the application and running the vision. And then it was control. It was talking to a yo-yo board, um, which was then interfacing with motor controllers and such. And and the basic idea is that the the uh, the vision tracking is governing the uh, direction that the pan tilt camera is going, and then the the pan tilt camera's direction is is dictating what the steering is trying to do. I don't know if you can tell, but there was a very poor uh, turning circle on that on that robot. Uh, at that time, it was only the front wheels that were steering and uh, and they don't do a whole lot of steering. So um, we had to sort of go beyond that. Here is the robot um, tracking a kid in an orange shirt. Uh, so kids do get a kick out of this robot. Again, it sort of presents like a dog to folks. I think we named it Argos on purpose. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, they have, a, they have a lot of fun um, playing with it. I think it was right here somewhere that the steering actually completely broke. Um, so I think it's going to stop, um, st uh, stop turning the wheels in a minute. Um, but we'll probably won't wait for that to happen. Uh, they came up with uh, version two of this robot um, in 2017, um, and the the big uh, so there was an improvement on the turn radius. So now it's steering uh, both from the front and the rear wheels, and um, uh, and we upgraded the control system to the Rib Robotics, and um, we're doing some Deforia. Hello, my name tracking. is Tycho Verani. On this one, these are all projects that um, I'm more involved in uh, with the with the team. This, these are things that we do during the summer. These are not street legal FTC robots. They are um, explorations in in um, uh, in engineering, and so I can actually you know participate a little bit in that um, more directly. Um, but uh, but they did most of the design and the programming on it, uh, and the, and the construction. Let me see if I can get to something with it tracking. I should have set up bookmarks, but I didn't. Oh, there, there's doing some vision tracking of that vision before you target. Uh, let's see. Actually, I think we can skip over the rest of this. 
Oh, there you go. <laughs> that was an, uh, that was a little bit of an experiment. Since we have steering on both the front and rear wheels, um, we can do a sort of sideways. Where did that go? There. A limited kind of sideways strafing kind of thing. Um, uh, we've taken it to, to South Padre um, a few times. And uh, unfortunately, I've, I've lost the video of it. Um, but in terms of how it deals with sand, um, it is probably my most capable robot on, on sand. It's not a great robot in water. Um, and, uh, you know, the motors are pretty rusty after some altercations with the Gulf. Um, it is not buoyant, uh, despite the fact that those wheels are uh, um, uh, pretty large and, and filled with, but they're filled with foam. They're not actually watertight. So um, here we took it to the Eclipse, and this was just a cute little clip of a fail. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay, so this brings us to Cartbot, which, um, the, the, so the videos I have right here are just the team fooling around um, and, and not demonstrating proper safety practices, but I thought I'd um, uh, fess up uh, and, and show it anyhow. Um, I don't really have videos of how it is similar to Argos, but it does basically the same things like the vision tracking that Argos does. So the purpose of it is, uh, what you can see here, this is a Rubbermaid utility cart. And the purpose of it is to carry our robot and its uh, and all of its tools uh, around at a competition, um, and uh, and we do do use it for that. But um, sometimes we play with it also. This is sort of earlier on in its development when we were testing it. In this case, uh, this is this is Karina, and she's not actually driving the robot at this point. She's just riding on it, <laughs> sort of load testing it. We're going to call it. <laughs> Uh, and there is another, so you can see that she's a little bit uncertain about this experience, partly probably because she's not in control of it. Uh, we've got another, another student who's actually in control of driving. Um, yep, that's what happens. Uh, this is her taking control. <laughs> Starting to get more familiar with it. And then, uh, and, and, and here she's starting to get comfortable with it. <laughs> All right. Um, but it's using the standard rev control system. I'm also using that rev control system on, uh, on Beachcomber. So Beachcomber is, uh, I think some of you have seen stuff about this uh, recently. So um, uh, hopefully we'll go through this pretty rapidly, but uh, um, this has a GPS RTK receiver on it. Uh, and the whole purpose was sort of to understand outdoor navigation a little bit better. Um, this robot has standard differential steer robot. This is the antenna. It's a L2, or um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dual frequency GPS uh, uh, antenna. And the brake here is the caster, effectively. And part of the idea was to do like basically just drawing in the sand. So this is a, a, a test of just being able to navigate around the beach and seeing what kind of markings it makes in the sand and where it gets stuck. What I don't show here is the fact that if there's really deep, soft, loose sand, it will get stuck. Um, there are, uh, you know, if, if one of those wheels starts free spinning, um, then it starts losing traction and, and there's no like second set of wheels to sort of get it over that uh, immediate challenge. So uh, there are downsides to to having a two-wheel robot outside. Uh, this is the uh, DPRG um, being written in the dirt of a, of a baseball field. 
Um, and this is actually the second pass of it going through. So you can see that it's tracking pretty well. And the, the only the only navigation it's using here is GPS. There is no uh, there's no odometry uh, happening on this one. Um, and uh, um, it's it, so it's tracking pretty well the the path uh, from before. Um, in best case scenarios, we get like about two centimeter accuracy. You can see it manages the transition to the grass. It's not actually, uh, it didn't lose its location. The, the actual pattern actually goes onto the grass there. Um, skip Kareem, on through. Yeah. I think, I think this is pretty good. So these are all, all right. the, the main robots that uh, is a background. And then there's your night light, uh, nighttime that you've shown. Yeah. Okay. I was just about at the end of it. I'll go ahead and show this one because this was the, the ul ulterior motive. Uh, and this is very short. <laughs> so yeah, that's just a uh, hedge clipper mounted on the side of the robot. And that's why it's turning in a, to the right because it's dragging on the ground. <laughs> very cool. Okay, thank you, Kareem. Sure. Uh, very nice. Okay, let's move on. So then, uh, with Jesse, do you have uh, something to present on the screen or just talk to? Yes, I have a PDF I'll show. Just okay. Second. It's cool. We have quite a variety here of uh, different styles and such. So. Panel questions will be interesting, I'm sure. All right. Do we see it or is it? J Rover Max. Yep. Yep. So J Rover Max is the rover I picked for my uh, rover for this. Uh, it is a HPI Baja 5B Flux Edition. And here's just an overview of the electronics. You can see a Raspberry Pi, a BNO IMU, a TNC on a board I designed and then an LED uh, for status. Um, the components are all mounted on two pieces of wood with spacers and then uh, a plexiglass shield on top of it. Um, the, the plexiglass is for weather protection and also for debris. And then as you can see though, in the second picture here, um, given the right conditions, it will fail. Um, this was during my testing for a barrel impact and the barrel hit my rover, flew over the top of it and completely destroyed uh, all the electronics uh, protection. Luckily all the electronics except for the TNC um, made it through. Um, I switched then from plexiglass to Lexan, which is much stronger. Um, here you can see I got my revenge against the barrels. Um, I actually hit the barrel hard enough to uh, embed plastic into the screw at the end of my bumper. I don't know exactly how fast you have to go to do that, but it's not slow. Um, and you can see off to the red also plastic transfer from hitting other barrels and having the barrels slide off to the side. That bumper was designed specifically to push the barrels out of the way. Here we have kind of my uh, suite of rovers starting from the left to the right. The far Left here is a um, kind of a more uh, commercial type design where I'm trying to get to something that people could replicate with the 3D printed case and electronics that are on a just a basic board that anyone could purchase. And then this middle one here is more of my experimental and over here you got your max and then to the far right, which you can see a little bit was a logistic spot that I entered at SparkFun ABC where you had to lift up these pool noodles that are made into hoops and transfer them from one pole to another. So that was all remote control, but you can see that a little bit. Uh, so Max, here's Max ready, set up for go with uh, impacts with the barrels. So we have this big uh, cow catcher PVC bumper in the front of it. I um, mean, see all the electronics are well enclosed in the middle. And here's another uh, previous image of that. And then here's one more. Uh, so J Rover is basically my software that I designed from scratch for 
autonomous rovers. Um, J Rover Max has competed in the SparkFun ABC from 2014 through 2017. We don't talk about 14, but uh, in 2015, I got second in the doping class, which was the highest in uh, of rovers. Um, and then in 2016, I got first in the heavyweight class, which was over 25 pounds. Then I also got third in the welterweight, what was between 10 and 25 pounds. I specifically asked if I could add more weight to my rover and compete in different classes. They said, I guess so. But when I showed up and did it, they said, hey, wait a second. And then I pointed out, they said it was okay. Um, interestingly, it actually did better in the heavyweight class. That year there was a dirt surface and adding the extra two pounds of weight made, made it have better traction. So it actually did better with the extra weight. So then in 2017, I won the overall, which in Speed Demons, which are the same thing. But uh, so as a result, I have four AVC medals. So that's kind of my claim to fame with this rover. And then I have some links. Um, I can sh have uh, Carl share this uh, links with everyone or the PDF I just presented. Um, I have a blog where I talk about my rovers. Um, I also have done a Sparkland blog post about them. And I'm also a leader for a group of around 200 members that all we do is talk about rovers. Um, so it's a mailing group, you're welcome to join. And then I have a couple of videos so you can see, um, I presented one of these before. Just a second, I need to switch to what window is showing. Should be coming up. Yep, there it is. So this is um, this is kind of a best of kind of a, so you can see what kind of impacts J Rover's been involved with. That was 2014, the one we don't talk about. Um, I had an impact with another rover, which actually caused my um, ECU basically to turn off. But so the steering angle is stuck and the throttle is on. So it, it sat there and done, did some circles for a while uh, <laughs> and gave quite entertainment. So here is my uh, big Rover Max. And here we can see an onboard footage of the what kind of damage he could do when he hits barrels. Um, he, he, do, he doesn't mess around. Then here I hit, I hit the hoop. And rather than cause the rover to stop, the rover kept going. And so I actually drug the the hoop around the course for quite a while. Um, <laughs> people uh, were very amused by this. Um, everyone was laughing. And so I ended up eventually getting stuck on the ramp and I moved the ramp a little bit, but I just wasn't able to completely move it. So here we have some more. Um, there was another rover that tried to mess with me, didn't go well for him. Then, of course, what I'm known for, barrel hits. Um, those are empty 55-gallon barrel hits. That's another view of that same rover that tried to hit me, um, which did not go his way. And then you'll see that's, that's a serious hit, and yet my rover is able to correct and still continue on despite that level of impact. Um, here we can see another hay bale impact. This, this stopped the rover. Uh, that, that was a little too much. But then um, here, here we have some other <laughs> uh, barrel hits. And as you can see, it corrected pretty well. It, it swayed a little bit. That one I didn't correct from. Um, but here's another impact with that same uh, rover. And here we have some other various course impacts. Um, Max, what Max is known for is taking a hit and keep going. Uh, in fact, that's Ted's head right there in, in front, but uh, Ted knows this rover pretty well based off of competitions. Um, there's another hit. That one actually killed the rover. Um, and uh, we'll see here. Um, you'll see over to the left that rover that crashed. If I had won this match, I would have won in 2016, but it sways a little bit to the inside and right there um was the end of my competition for the day 
but I appreciate uh, th this time and thank you. Cool, thanks, Jesse. And you've so you've been doing this for a few years yourself, then I would gather. Yeah, I started really in vain in two thousand, actually two thousand eight, and I first started on my rover in two thousand eleven, and my first AVC was in two thousand fourteen. And then cool. I've been working with Max since fifteen. Fucking over barrels, excellent. Okay, so that uh, that is our four panelists, and we've spent uh, a little longer, up to ten minutes each. I think we shorted uh, Mr. Anderson a little bit, but let's see. Uh, so at this point now, let's dive into some questions and. Uh, these are again uh, compiled from uh, last Tuesday night in our regular session. We did some brainstorming and I tried to organize them in some way. So uh, around our 10-ish questions, the first one is for getting started. So for somebody that's never built an outdoor rover before, maybe they've only done indoor robots or maybe they have no robot experience. They don't know about elements or water. So how would you recommend to get started? What are the top five or 10 gotchas? Anybody, panelist. I mean, I'll um, like I mentioned before the as far as you know, you have to think about the development process. In, in my opinion, they um, you know picking it up and carrying it around and um, does it have handles on it? You know, a lot of builders just focus on the core functionality. Oh, how do I get it to navigate? Um, but I think one of, for me, one of the gotchas is is those things you, that are aren't primary functionality um, that can really get in the way of your development process. I'll, I'll Mark, second that in, in that um, you know I mentioned before that I don't want a robot that's heavier than I am willing to carry, and uh, Scott's solution about having uh, the remote control works when the robot's working but an example i've had is i'm halfway up the mountainside in colorado when a wheel shaft broke and now i've got to carry this big awkward 25 pound thing back down the mountain through the trees and uh and it's a pain so that would be my suggestion don't build anything any heavier than you want to carry and i'd add to that we follow your advice david um every team must build a handle into the robot. That is the most important uh, feature. Well, I, I think it's also important to not build one that's that can go faster than you can run after it too. <laughs> but how, how do you get started then? Because I, I gather, well, except for uh, David, maybe you didn't just sit down one night and say, I'm gonna build this large complicated robot that does all these fancy things. So how, how'd you get started? I, I would suggest starting with a small scale RC car or truck, um, something like 112 scale or 110 scale, and just get used to driving it around first to get some idea of the handling characteristics. Then try to uh, drive it through a microcontroller. When you start, you don't even need to have any fancy sensors. You can just send signals to the steering and motor and drive it around that way. And then slowly think about what you want it to become, but start small. Starting with a 25 or 40 pound rover, whatever, you have to build a platform first. So it's a lot easier to start with a pre-existing platform than to start from scratch. Now I'll check in that. And uh, also, I don't know if you noticed that Kareem uh, toward the end had graduated toward the lock crawler. Uh, the advantage of the lock crawler over a mm -hmm. standard RC car is that the standard RC cars are designed to go fast. Uh, 35 miles an hour is not unusual. Uh, and you don't want a robot. You want a robot that has high torque, not high speed. And uh, that's exactly what the rock crawlers do. They're low RPM, high torque. Uh, and that's much more amenable to what to what we're trying to do. Yeah, uh, and the decision that has to be made right out the gate, and I think this mm -hmm. is what Jeff is referring to, uh, is whether you want to build a, a platform that has axon steering or that has differential steering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Scott and I both uh, went with differential steering. Uh, 
and depending on what the robot is going to do, if it's going to be on a racetrack, that probably doesn't make any difference. But if it's actually going to be the rover that rover, the roves around in, in the real world, uh, having zero turning radius, being able to get out of tight spots uh, is uh, invaluable. Uh, and it, it, it makes the control for navigation easier, too. Ackerman steering is a little harder to um, determine a path, whereas with differential, if you need to turn left, you just turn left. Whereas with the Ackerman so steering, you kind of have to pivot. Even humans have trouble uh, with Ackerman steering when they get into a dead-end alley. Uh, when you can't just rotate in place, you've got to go forward and back up and go forward and back up. Even us humans, that, that's a difficult task. So it's best if you can avoid that with your robot. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of problems with trying to do differential steering outdoors. And uh, Scott has run into some of those with a tripod platform. Uh, Scott, if I can be so bold, uh, is not really stable. Uh, just three points touching the ground is not really stable. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to, it depends on what you want. What you, how you find outdoors. If outdoors means lawn in your backyard, you're probably okay. Um, in fact, outdoors means that you'd like to be able to drive along the road and stop when you see an interesting geological outcrop and whip your robot out and say, go do it. Uh, then problems are going to be much more uh, complex. And uh, that's actually why Mike and I uh, went with the, uh, with the suspension, the independent wheel uh, suspension. Uh, so that I would say that's the biggest the biggest decision to make at the beginning is whether you want to be able to differentially steer, which I recommend, or you want to do active and steer. And that totally depends on uh, what your what your goal is. Yeah. Did anybody well, say like a wild thumper type chassis? One that pivots maybe in the center? What you really want it. You really want all the wheels to be on the ground all the time. And if you don't have independent suspension, three of the wheels will be on the ground and one of them will be up in the air. And that's, Which that's is why the robot makes sense. If, you're, if you I'm don't sorry. have suspension. I, I'm sorry, Kareem, I, did, I didn't catch you. Oh, yeah, three, like Scott's three-wheeler, uh, it doesn't need suspension necessarily because it'll always have three points of contact, regardless of whether you consider it stable from a tipping over standpoint. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you uh, can play with the dimensions of the platform. And if you notice, um, I've got some really wide, very small diameter wheels on there. Um, the first iteration, you know, I had very much like Kareem's uh, Raker robot with the very tall, thin, almost bicycle looking wheels. Um, and not only was it a little bit more unstable, but um, just like Karine had mentioned, you know, it can get stuck easily, right? Because you don't have a lot of traction on the ground. Um, and David, you made the comment to me one time about equalizing the pressure or, or lightening the pressure per wheel so that when your robot went over something, it really didn't dig in on a soft surface. Um, so that was one of my motivations when I put the, the, the wider wheels on there, um, just for that same reason, just for traction. Cause, um, in the one Robo Columbus, you know, it, it got stuck and I had to kind of kick it. The judges didn't see me. So I don't think I got points taken off, but, um, I had to kind of kick it in the butt and say, keep going. Uh, you're not done yet. So, um, Certainly better traction and, and uh, you know, stable platform, I think, is really what you're driving at, David, is whether or not three wheels. And, and you know, I think you could debate um, the stability of a three wheel platform, depending on its dimensions and, you know, the center of gravity and, and a lot of different factors. Um, it, but I agree with you. If you're really going over some serious terrain, you're going to need, you know, a, a different platform. But but any successful projects. You know, the first thing you need to start with is, you know, what's my objective here? Where, where am I going with this? Um, and sometimes you learn a lot of things as you go along in that process, but you have to start somewhere. And, and I agree with Jesse, start simple, you know, start easy, um, something you're familiar with, something you're comfortable with, and expand from there. Um, that would be my advice. Did anybody look at a wild thumper chassis? You know, do you know what those are? It's like a, it's a, you know, um, 
a four-wheel drive chassis. It has a pivot between the front and the back wheels. And, um, you know, the oh. you can get them in four-wheel or six-wheel. And uh, they're, they're expensive. They're, they're definitely, you know, you spend probably a couple hundred dollars on one. But, it, you know, as far as having all wheels on, you know, in contact and stuff like that, that seems like that would be, you know, an ideal chassis for are you talking like about a twist pivot along the spine or are you talking about from wheel to wheel like a rocker bogey or are you talking about um a, a bending spine kind of forward bending and backwards? spine yeah or you know it has a pivot between say the between front the set of wheels and back wheels. okay yeah and then that way it keeps all your you know you're more likely to have all wheels on a surface so not from an outdoor perspective, but I, my, one of my teams did a did a robot that that basically had a, a spine that let you bend forward and backwards. But again, it wasn't outdoor focused. Oh, okay. I will say just as a as a encouragement that uh, the radio control car guys have solved a lot of the problems that we have, and you can go there and buy in little plastic bags off the shelf, you know constant velocity points and you know <clears throat> suspensions and just all kinds of things uh we don't really have to reinvent that part uh they they have solved a lot of those problems um the uh the rc car that the jbot robot was built from or the parts that was used was actually one and a half cars um had a his electric car and it had a full up on weight of about 13 pounds so with uh, four wheels, uh, that gives you about three, three plus pounds per wheel uh, loading. Uh, now I've gone to six wheels, and I'm right at about uh, 24 pounds or something like that. So, uh, so I've gone to four, about four pounds per wheel loading, and that required me to stiffen up the suspension on each, uh, on each one of the channels. Uh, and you, as you say, you buy all those parts. You know, you go down and you say, "I need a stiffer suspension here. Here's a set of wheels. Here's a set of shocks." Um, you know, all, the other thing I found was that the rough rock crawler wheels, the ones that have a whole lot of uh, tread on them, uh, turned out harder to use. Uh, the ones I went with were called the Road Rage Road Rage wheels, and they're basically they have almost no traction on them at all. Uh, and so uh, when the wheel scrubs sideways in a turn, uh, there's very little friction against that sideways uh, turning. So that was one of the things along the way. We, we tried a whole bunch of different wheels, uh, big ones and small ones and all kinds of things. And these are the ones that seem to perform best. It can go up, I mentioned before, can go over curbs, uh, can go up and down steps. Uh, Scott, can your three-wheel robot go up and down steps? No, I, I can go over a curb. I can go up it. I don't know if I'd want to go down one because it is a little front heavy and would tend to tilt forward. Um, but as you know, I've, yes, I've had it go over curbs. Um, it wasn't real pretty, but it did it. <laughs> well, I would say being able to climb over curbs is like one of the <clears throat> one of the design criteria for an outdoor robot because they're everywhere. Uh, and uh, depending on how tall they are, I, I mentioned that the j robot can, can sense everything it can't climb over, and it can climb over everything it can't sense. So for most curbs, it, the sonar doesn't see the curb, and you climb right over it. If it's a real tall curb, the sonar will see it, and so you'll turn and drive along parallel to it in order to try to find a place to climb. Yeah, if you do go for an off-the-shelf uh, RC chassis, you want to make sure you get something fairly like a major brand that you can replace the parts easily because you will be doing that a lot. And it's a lot nicer to just replace the parts you break than have to go out and buy a whole new entire chassis. I'll, uh, I'll jump in that there is a slight gotcha there in that um, those are highly tuned for the weight, the expected weight of those platforms. And we're adding a bunch of extra you know, batteries and sensors and controllers and things like that. Uh, so you can you can definitely run into situation, especially if you put something like an arm on it. Um, you're not going to be in the expected zone of like what their shocks are expected to bear. 
and so you need to upscale to a different part and and and, uh, and sometimes it's just not available like we're already at fifth scale with the stuff that we're doing and there isn't much around that we can turn to when we're really loading down the robot i thought i would uh, very quickly just for a quick laugh show you how we handle steps um is that okay carl Go for it, and then we'll move on to the third question. I think we've actually covered the second one. This is very short. <laughs> yeah, Green, I was going to ask you if you, you know, the the rock, the bigger rock crawler chassis seems really top heavy. Um, so is stability a problem that you deal with on that one, I guess? Uh, it depends entirely on the terrain. Um, the, um, at, at times, we had um, a way too heavy wooden platform on top, uh, and we have since reduced it to a very, very light. Uh, it's still a wooden platform, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very light ply, high-quality high ply, uh, and that's reduced the, the, the center of gravity considerably. Um, but, but it is a problem, and that's a problem you're going to face. You've got to decide how much clearance you want underneath, what is the maximal obstacle you want to deal with? And that's going to set your height. You can't really set stuff below that. So it's a trade-off. You, you yeah. did get down the stairs, though. You know? It gets down the stairs very well. Yeah. <laughs> OK, OK. Can I show a, a, a video of uh, my robot going up and down stairs? Let's, let's see it. The gauntlet is down. Uh, actually, it would probably be better for me just to put it uh, in the chat. OK. And, and the, because of the slowness of my. So um, I'll do that and I'll shut up. Uh, okay, we'll look for your we'll look for your link. Um, if it's on your website, I have that page open already. Actually, no. Okay, all right. So we'll wait for his link. Um, oh, well, and can I, am I allowed to do something? Can I put a, a link also? I won't talk otherwise. Uh, I've got a 60 second video of a six wheeled robot going up and down stairs. But it's simulated. Put a it's link. In. Put a, put a link in. Okay, will do. Okay, thank you, Ron. Okay, so uh, let's try and get on uh, question three here and then we'll, we'll follow up with as these videos uh, come available. Why do I have this open twice? Let me see just a second. I'm not presenting yet. Here we go. Okay, so uh, question two, I think we've largely covered. Uh, I, uh, yep, except for the snow, I didn't. I didn't, was guessing that no, nobody from Dallas had any great recommendations for how to make something drive through snow. Sorry, Pat. Uh, that takes us to me later this week. <laughs> so, oh yeah, we might need to figure that out soon. Yeah. Uh, okay, so question group kind of three is around environmental. So we've seen the beach, we've seen all kinds of nasty outdoor uh, space. So how do you keep the moisture and, and junk out of electronics and moving parts? What kind of connectors and seals do you like? How do you do that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> I heard rusty motors from Kareem, so just replace the <laughs> motors. That's an option. Hey David and Anderson, uh, didn't didn't Mike say that you know the RC cars were made for middle-aged men with a lot you know with a fair amount of disposable income? Wasn't that his thing? You remember that? Yes. I asked him one time. I said he showed me a new design, and I said, "Now is this for a teenager the day after Christmas with a fistful of grandma's money?" And he said, "No, this is for a single middle-aged engineer with disposable income." <laughs> Some of the newer Traxxas vehicles are actually, for the most part, waterproof. Um, and then you can always go low school for your electronics. And I've actually put mine in a Tupperware container before, or just like a disposable sandwich container or something like that, or even a Ziploc bag, if that's all you got. But you don't have to spend a lot of money on watertight containers. I brought up the uh, link there. I accidentally entered it twice. I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing. It shows uh, uh, J-Bot going up and down some steps there. You guys can uh, link that on your own. It's probably the fastest way to do it. Oh, yeah, it's a download. Okay. Okay, thanks. Cool. 
And um, well, okay. to, to, to answer the question from my perspective is, um, you know, you saw the enclosure that I have. Um, of course, it's got holes in it because it was, you know, uh, leftover material. Um, I really haven't had a, or seen a, a huge need from my experience of, um, you know, dealing with copious amounts of water, let's say. I mean, you know, the grass would be wet or you may go through a mud puddle. Um, but, you know, I typically don't take the thing out in the rain and I typically try not to drive it through, you know, a puddle of water. Um, so, you know, I, I usually don't spend a lot of time in, in the environmental or waterproofing kind of side of it. Now, like Jesse's robot, where the, the boards were just sitting on top of the, the um, panel or like Kareen's, you know, you may have um, a little bit more concern there, especially if you're running over 55 gallon barrels. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's, again, getting back to, you know, what's the objective here? You know, what, where, what environment is this going to, do I expect it to operate in? Right? Yeah, yep. I would sort of uh, avoid the question because, uh, again, we, we, uh, we operate outdoors when it's nice outdoors. There's no driving need to, to um, handle it in all sorts of different conditions. And so uh, that's what we that's what we focused on right now. Um, okay. So no experience in actual designing for weatherization. The consensus I'm hearing is whatever. Don't worry okay. about it. Don't yeah, worry don't, about it. Don't sweat it. <laughs> Forget about it. Okay. Let's, uh, I got David Anderson's uh, stair video here briefly. Uh, we'll step through that and then get on to the next question. Look at that thing. Piece of cake. Now those look like rather gentle stairs at SMU, not not the real steep well, stairs, but still. It's going to come back up. You see the robot turn there to the right just as it got off the step screen. That's what I was talking about. The sonar in this case was before I mounted the servo. Mm. And so as it comes down the steps, it sees the bottom of the steps as, a, as an obstacle. Uh, this particular routine, I just told it to drive around the square and two of the points of the squares are at the top of the steps. This is Dallas Hall, the big uh, main hall on the campus that has been used. Well, I, it probably can't handle regular rise run steps, can it? I, I believe it can. I've done that before. Uh, this is, these were just the only steps that were available when I shot the video. If you watch the center wheels, uh, you can see how they uh, alternate with the end wheels so That's that nice. you're never pushing, you're always climbing. Yeah, more points of contact, more better. Huh. Nicely done. The gauntlet is thrown. Okay, yeah, so really. now, <laughs> now we know what we have to do. Outdoor stair climbers. Well, oh, I have a couple of other comments that I wrote down while people were asking questions. Should we wait to the end for that, or should I do those now? Uh, why don't you keep it? Uh, keep an eye out for these and see if they already fit in, and then okay. otherwise we'll uh, we'll catch up with them uh, towards the end. Okay. The fourth question is around power. How much do you need, and where do you get it from? Uh, and then uh, various stations on this were. If uh, you have a brushless motor, how are you controlling the speed controller? What do you recommend for power and why? We had a brief discussion on uh, gas electric hybrids last Tuesday. Somebody mentioned thorium reactors. So power, how much we need and why? How I'm going to jump out on a limb and say a thorium reactor is probably not a good idea. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the other thing is... Flux capacitor. Yeah, flux capacitor, yeah. That'd be okay. Um, you know, if you know, my experience of building a, the donkey car, right, which is an RC-based uh, platform, you know, they talk about the brushless motors, um, and they don't recommend using them because they have a very poor load speed control. Um, you know, robots tend to spend a lot of their time at, at a lower velocity, right? Avoiding an obstacle, going around an obstacle, turning, 
Um, so you really need a, a drive system that that handles well at low speeds as well as high speeds. And and velocity is really not not the problem. Or you know, uh, uh, speed's not your friend when you're trying to control it via sensors and um, you know trying to avoid obstacles. So uh, you know, my opinion is is Brushless is not the way to go because of the poor low RPM response. I'd, uh, I just add into that. Uh, I think Scott was saying that uh, what we've discussed before, that speed is the enemy of smart, or fast is the enemy of smart. Uh, but at the same time, our, uh, uh, our robots really do need a lot of torque. Uh, and if you think about a differentially steered robot, the ability to precisely control the wheels at a very, very slow speed translates into the ability to steer precisely. Uh, because as you steer, you slow down, you know, the inside wheel. So it's not just uh, creeping along really slowly that you need to be able to do, but you need to be able to steer precisely. And that means having very precise control of the wheels when they're very slow. I've always taken the brushed motors and put them in my RC cars instead of most people take the brush motors out and put in brushless. I put in brush motors and I gear them down as much as I can. So it's a really small pinion and really large spur for the same reasons, even with my rovers. And I agree, speed kills. I've killed a lot of robots that way. <laughs> Cool. So we have a pretty one good of, Go ahead. One of the ways I've addressed that problem, and this is for all the robots, not just the outdoor robots, but uh, basically the algorithms in my robot only allow the robots to go full speed in the absence of any sensor detection. When you start detecting things with sensors, the first thing you do is slow down. And uh, you're only allowed to go full speed when you can't see anything to bump into. So... <clears throat> Basically, the steering, this may be too large a subject for today, but on a differential drive robot, the precision of the steering goes up as the velocity goes down. I would point out something like a gasoline engine introduces a lot of electrical noise to a, a robot um, from the spark plug and then the vibrations of the motor itself. Um, unless you really need to build a bigger rover with like a long uh, time running, I really suggest sticking with electrical power. And then you need to do your own research of LiPo versus nickel metal hydrate, et cetera, and just understand the safety concerns of certain battery chemistries and safely how to charge them because it's, it's, it's a real danger of, of burning something down, either your rover or your house. Or the back seat of your car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's a good point for the brushless motors as well. They generate a lot of EMF. They, there's a lot of electrical noise that is generated from them um, that can cause haywire on you know the rest of your electronics. So it's just another good reason to stay away from them. But brush motors do as well. You just need oh. to have capacitors on them to help dampen it out but you're never going to get rid of it they're there with brush motors too right but you can run a brush motor at a lot lower frequency than the brushless that's true so, so your your noise frequency is is much lower right Easier but in a, in a brush motor though you have arcing with the contacts where you don't have that yeah. with the brushless so every oh, every exactly. different power that solution has some well. right with some snubbing caps on the mm -hmm. on the lead and typically right. the way you do that is each lead has a cap from the lead to ground uh, which typically is just the case of the motor and then there's yep. another cap between the two leads and that that does a pretty good job of, of sucking up all that noise mm -hmm. well you know a, a well-designed h bridge is is also very helpful uh eliminating the noise or at least you know dissipating it yeah, the like a lithium iron phosphate battery, say 24 volts, um, 100 amp hours, you know, it's, it's still about a thousand dollars. So, 
gasoline engine is you can get them pretty cheap so <laughs> um i don't know if the, if the cost doesn't come down i uh i think i may be on the big platforms i'm going to be sticking with the gas engine so well ray i have robots i've been running for 20 years and i'm a little nervous 20 years from now i might not be able to buy any gasoline oh that's true maybe not I do have an extra solar panel. It's only 230 watts, though. <laughs> so right. I didn't hear a consensus on 12 volt or 24 volt motors, and I guess we didn't discuss battery types. 24. So, so who who would like to address why you want a higher voltage versus lower voltage? Higher voltage means lower current for the same amount of power which means that you can get by with hobby type controllers. Almost all and industrial controllers, and I would bow to Scott on this because he knows a lot more, but uh, most of the industrial uh, controllers I've seen are 24 volts or 48 volts. One yeah, well, 24 volts is a very standard motor voltage as well. Um, unless, you know, you, you stick with some sort of car motor um, and they typically don't have uh, encoders on them. So um you know i i agree 24 is probably the sweet spot um <clears throat> and and you know for the electronics as well so and more voltage, less current for, yeah smaller so consequently for the same loss in the wiring your what wire diameter can be half is that well, right yeah. or do i have that right well, for the, the other thing is you, you still need some overhead in your motor, right? Because like David was saying is, is you need torque. So even if you're running at, at full speed, you, you need some overhead there so that if you're going up a hill, you can maintain full speed, right? Because if your H bridge gets saturated, then you're not controlling it. And in a differential steel robot, then you potentially could, um, you know, uh, not go in a straight line. So you still have to have enough voltage because, you know, with DC motors, right, voltage is speed, current is torque. So you still have to have the voltage to um, have, the, and have enough overhead in current to, to keep that at a constant speed. Um, and that, you know, I think most of us do that, that, you know, we tune our PIDs to where I usually go at about 80 to 85% of the rated voltage of the motor um, just so that I have that, that overhead to handle any obstacles, like, like when David's robot was climbing up the steps, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of torque that was required to do that. Um, and to be able to do that in a straight line, you have to have enough, uh, you know, overhead in your, your control algorithm to, to maintain that. Hey, that's an interesting thing, uh, Scott, just to hear you say that. Never really thought about it in that situation. If you noticed you were saturating, you know, on one or the other channels to go ahead and say, hey, I need to reduce my velocity, uh, you know, target velocity needs to come down a bit because, you know, we're now going to experience uh, whatever heading errors if it's a differential drive. Right. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks. And I think there was another uh, question floating out for a recommended battery type. I think, Jesse, you said just do your research, for example, LiPo versus nickel metal hydride. But what's the consensus amongst the four of you? What's your preferred battery? LiPo. 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 Everything I have uses LiPo except this JBot Rover, which uses nickel metal hydride. It uses two 10 cell sub C packs to get the 24 volts. Uh, <clears throat> nickel metal hydride batteries are heavier. And while normally we think, oh, heavy bad, point of fact with the robot, you need some weight. You need some weight to get traction. If you're going to ever add a gripper to the thing, you need some weight to to uh, bounce against that. And so uh, when I replaced the batteries on the JBot robot last year, I thought real hard about replacing them with uh, with LiPos because that's what I use on everything else. Uh, and I got all the chargers and everything. Uh, but instead, I went back uh, because it wasn't heavy enough. I went back to the to the 20 cells of uh, of the nickel metal hydride. Nickel metal hydride are less fussy. They don't have a self discharge like the LiPos do. Uh, they don't blow up if you discharge them below uh, their requested uh, safe zone and so forth. 
<clears throat> and you can top them off, which you can't do with, say, uh, uh, well, the standard rechargeable. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's a toss up. Uh, but at this point, I say all my other robots use nickel metal hydrides. Well, I, I would use, have to use just... lipo. And I would definitely reiterate Jesse's comment about charging them properly. And that's the same thing David was just talking about is if you go to LiPoly um, or some of the newer, you know, lithium chemistries today, um, absolutely get the proper charger um, and follow the, you know, the correct charge rates and all that. And the batteries will last a very long time and, um, you know, keep them in their safety region, basically. We use all we we use three different chemistries. So we have lead acid on the cart bot. We've got nickel metal hydrides on the um, on on most of our competition robots because that's a requirement. Um, and uh, and but I prefer lipos for their um, you know energy density basically. And uh, you can get weight out of a lipo if you go to a big enough battery pack. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. You got to keep things rolling. So question five, communication. Um, onboard buses, what do you like and why? I think we've heard a little bit from Scott already on that. Robot telemetry, what do you like and why? And then uh, we had a handful of questions. What can you recommend for an emergency stop? The big red button somewhere. Speak up, David. Uh, okay, for the, for the top one, I... Uh, almost all the devices on the JBot are serial devices. And so I got a bunch of UARTs, and that's how I talked to them. So there's not a bus per se. Uh, what was the second question? Put it back up there. Uh, remote telemetry. Oh, okay. Um, I do that two different ways. Let me see if I can shoot the robot back over here. Uh, let's see, I can hit that over here on this side. I don't think you can see it. Uh, there is an XB, which is how I do my remote telemetry. Uh, there's another XB with a USB dongle that plugs into the laptop, and that's how they talk to each other. On this side over here, this little black box here is a, uh, the other end of this uh, key fob. And that key fob is my uh, emergency stop. And uh, I found it, to, the only reason I have this is because some contests require it. Uh, my robot's not faster than me, and I just walk around with it. Uh, I never let it out of my sight, or very rarely. So there's not really any use for a thing like this. And I also found that they want a dead man out of SRS, which means you got to hold that damn button down, you know, maybe through a 15-minute run, which gets really fatiguing. So I've got a software switch that can say instead uh, – it's a live man. You have to actually push the button to stop it rather than release the button. But out in, uh, at the SRS, they actually uh, made us show that you could drop the remote on the ground and the robot would stop, which they're real worried about suit out there. Something we haven't thought that much about. So basically, there are two um, <clears throat> separate uh, 900 megahertz and the, and the XP. Uh, and then this is my... Uh, my emergency stop, which I've only ever used in contest. I've never found any reason to use it except in a contest. Uh, then if you see this big red button right there, that big red button is reset. And so if you hit reset, the robot comes. Through. So if for some reason there's some emergency, you can uh, jump over there and stop that button and the robot will stop. That's it. Cool. Okay, other thoughts on communication, onboard, telemetry, remote, remote so, stop. So I normally use I2C for my buses, but at the same time, I use whatever sensor it has, if it's USB or serial or whatever, it really depends what you're doing. Um, a lot of times you may not have a choice of what bus you use. Um, for telemetry and communication, I've used like the... SIK radios, which were originally the 3, 3DR radios in the 900 megahertz range, because they have really good um, distance and they're very good with noise. 
Just make sure you change it from the, the default ID so you don't have 10 people on the same telemetry channel. I learned that one the hard way. Um, and then as far as the kill switch goes, what I normally do is I just use my RC remote. And what I've done in the past is just made it so that if I squeeze the trigger when it's in competition mode, it shuts off. But I'm kind of rethinking that for the future. And it'd be more like if it loses communication with the radio, like I turn it off, then you would have some channels that default to a certain PWM signal, like for your RC cars and that, so that they can have a default signal. And when that default signal is seen, it would shut off the rover. That way, if you the remote fails or you get outside of distance, the rover would automatically shut off. So it's kind of like a dead man switch, but with the RC remote. Yeah, I use, um, I use something similar today. Was this my little RC remote? And I have uh, buttons here, one to make it start, and, and the other one is the stop switch. Um, plus, I have a big, big uh, toggle switch on the side with a LED in it. Um, it's more like a like a kill switch that basically disconnects power so everything we do is uh uh is wi-fi we've got a wi-fi dashboard um running on the robot um and uh and we've got a pair of android devices so the driver always has one of those pairs um and so the robot um is uh, is constantly pulling the uh, the driver's device to see if it's there, and if it's not, uh, it'll stop. So it's more of a live man switch, I guess. Um, and uh, is that a live man or a dead man? I don't know. Don't know how to think about it. Uh, and we're we're sort of relegated to I squared C as our uh, as our onboard bus because that's what we have. I'd prefer if we had CAN. Okay, cool. All right. Very good. So let's move on to question six, which is actually a pair of questions. It has expanded since the initial draft. Uh, this first one is the kind of high level thing. I'll leave it up for a while. Uh, you'll notice 10 slides dragged into 11 or 12. I don't know anymore. But this one is about location estimating and navigating. So where are you and how do you get where you want to be? And uh, on this higher level page, uh, what do you think about autopilots, recommendations for data fusion with GPS, you know, DIY versus off the shelf, what methods do you like? And then other high level questions like describe your obstacle avoidance strategy, what's your main controller? So there's a potpourri of questions. So if somebody wants to pick one and dive in, just jump right in. I guess I'll... I'll um... My my personal preference is is all DIY. I, it frustrates me to try to figure out what someone else did or how to implement it. And then if I have bugs in it, um, you know, who can you turn to? What kind of information is available? Um, I would much rather. My personal opinion is I would much rather struggle and and do it myself than try to struggle and figure out someone else's. Um, and I did the same thing with uh, the GPS. Actually, David's paper that he, I think, believe you still have it posted up there, David, that has some very useful um, odometry uh, um, equations, um, the GPS equations of how to calculate the distance and, and um, angle to that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm much more of a, a DIYer personally. Um, some people, you know, I'm sure I'll have a different opinion on that. Um, so the, the obstacle avoidance, I think, is a whole presentation, a whole series of discussions. Um, there's a lot of interesting things you can do depending on your sensor data, how much data you have, um, even different levels of sensors. For instance, like my CAN robot, right? I have um, long range sensors and short range sensors. So the integration of those is, is an interesting topic. Um, you know, so I think the, you know, obviously the, the obstacle strategy should be not to run into something, but how you get there um, can take on a variety of, of strategies. And, and I've played with a bunch of them um, on, on several of my robots. So 
I don't know that I've really honed in on one particular that um, I would say this works better. Um, so that's my take on that. Um, and of course, you know, my main controller is, is all embedded stuff. So I, I really like the Cortex M3s. There's plenty of horsepower there. Um, I've actually just started playing with the ST platform, which has some interesting features that the LPC platform I'm more familiar with um, doesn't, doesn't have. Um, so, you know, I, I think you pick a, a, a line of chips or um, ones that you're familiar with, ones you have tools to work with, um, sometimes is, is the guiding factor um, as far as what your main controller is. Thank you. So I'm another DIY guy for autopilots for very similar reasons. And the other thing is just to understand how it works. If you use an off the shelf solution, you're not really going to understand in intricate detail how something like dead reckoning works or how you set up for an encoder if you use an off the shelf solution. The other side of that coin is though something like robot operating system Ross or the DIY RoboCars type solution our DIY, our do Rover, um, those are ready to go. And sure, you, you're going to need to learn how to use them, but they'll be much more fully featured than what you can do when you're doing it on your own. So it depends what your end goal is and what your experiences are in the past. But I agree for the same reasons that I want to understand how it works and do it all myself. Uh, that as far as data fusion goes, Honestly, I've done mostly dead reckoning in the past, so I haven't had a need for data fusion. But uh, if I do something like just Robo Magellan, I would probably be doing a combination of dead reckoning and GPS. And the, the really advanced way to do something like that with data fusion is something like a, a Kalman filter. Um, my favorite would be a unscented, but that's like going very deep into math and you have to really have an understanding of calculus to really be able to fully implement a solution like that. So hopefully you could find the off the shelf uh, common filter setup where you could uh, use that to fuse your data. Um, my obstacle strategy so far has been go through um, or <laughs> uh, try to just avoid through my route planning. Um, but when you have obstacles that can move, I just go through them. And then my main controller is, and my bigger bots is going to be a Raspberry Pi with a Teensy, which is a very cool microprocessor. And then for my smaller bots, it's just a Teensy by itself. So the Pi does the high level navigation planning and parsing the LiDAR input or cameras or RTK. And then the micro does the encoding and also sends out the signals to the servos, etc. And then also pings the Pi, and if for any reason the Pi becomes unresponsive, then the microcontroller has the authority to shut the rover down. Cool. I would uh, I would follow on from that uh, with what both Jesse and Scott observed uh, just by adding that you know if you buy an uh, off the shelf solution. Uh, and there are good reasons for doing that in some cases. Uh, but you're also buying the way the designer of that off-the-shelf solution thought about the problem. And that's really going to control what you do. And I have found often the case that it's down at the driver level. Uh, that's the conceptualization of the, of the sensors down at the driver level is at least for me, is part of what I don't want to give up. That's part of what you give up when you buy an off-the-shelf solution. You bought somebody else's idea of how that sensor should be used. And uh, I don't necessarily think you want to be limited by that. Um, <clears throat> for um, data fusion, uh, this robot uh, basically fuses uh, the yaw value of the IMU uh, with the distance traveled value of the wheels. Uh, so there is a hybrid odometry. Uh, now, in, in fact, uh, when we first got it working, we, we implemented and tested the full-up odometry uh, and, and actually got it to work pretty well. Uh, 
and then once that was working, basically you pull out uh, in in, base, in traditional odometry, uh, your sample by sample uh, heading uh, is calculated by basically the difference between the two wheels uh, divided by the wheelbase. So it's like you've got a little right triangle there, and uh, <clears throat> then you plug that into a to a bit of trig in order to get the robot's location. Uh, on this robot, <clears throat> while it does calculate all that from the wheels, it actually takes the the heading value from the IMU. Uh, just a second. Muted. Go ahead, David. So, uh, so that's the only data fusion it uses. This uh, robot also has a GPS. But all of the navigation the robot does is based on uh, wheel odometry. Uh, you're seeking toward a, a waypoint uh, and avoiding obstacles in between. And uh, the GPS is only used because when you show up at some contest, they want to give you the locations as GPS locations. And so what I have in the robot, there is math that converts those GPS locations uh, into the reference frame of the robot. Uh, so given three or four or five GPS locations, that gets turned into uh, basically wave, waypoints on the uh, on the grid that the robot is, uh, is navigating on. Uh, so the GPS is not actually used specifically uh, as part of the navigation, but rather just to translate. Uh, I have a, a function, there's a switch you can throw that says when you are doing the Robo Magellan and you find an orange cone and you've touched that orange cone, now you can use that known GPS location to correct the location of your robot. That seemed like a good idea at the time, but what I found from practical experience is that that expects that the contest organizers laid out those GPS accurately, and in point of fact, they didn't. So it's better off just to stay with the robot's feel of where it was rather than move it off to the mistaken location of where the orange cone is. It's fascinating. So uh, David, just real quick, when you talk about the yaw, so you mean the heading, your, your IMU is providing a, like a heavily filtered compass, uh, you know, modified by gyro kind of thing. And you're using that to potentially correct what you think a heading is. Is that, is that right? Not, not to correct it, to become the heading. Okay. Uh, the IMU has, uh, that's what Jesse was saying, there's a Coleman filter, a pretty sophisticated one in the IMU. This is a case where I did just buy uh, the solution. And uh, that's a nine-axis IMU, so it's got three-axis gyros, three-axis accelerometers, and three-axis magnetometers. And basically, the accelerometers correct the drift in the gyros. Uh, and the, let me see if I have that right. Yes. And the magnetometer corrects the drift in the heading. Uh, but for my purposes, I tell the IMU that I want Euler angle. So it gives me back a, a yaw, a roll, and tilt. And uh, yaw, I just plug directly into the location calculations. So the wheels tell me how far I went in the last 20th of a second. <clears throat> but the, the gyro correct, no. Oh, the magnetometer corrected gyroscope tells me the heading, and I calculate the location uh, from that. Okay. Oh, very good. So then in Jesse's case, I guess, he's using the IMU exclusively for heading. Is that right, Jesse? Correct. I'm, I'm relying on the built-in filter of the Beano 55. Okay. Bye. Yeah, it makes sense because you don't have accurate knowledge about your right, steering right. angles. Okay. Thank you. Well, I also disable the magnetometer because I think that introduces too much air. The, uh, uh, the magnetometer on the on the uh, microstrain device that I'm using works uh, remarkably well, and you can think about it if you if you imagine it uh, that it's returned in in terms of quaternions rather than Euler angle. Uh, what you imagine is that you have a sphere and cutting through that sphere is a vector that points basically to the North Star. And that no matter how your robot is oriented, uh, that vector continues to point at the North Star. And so to, uh, to navigate in any particular direction is just an offset uh, from that vector. 
and it's remarkably, remarkably robust. I've got a video I think most of the people here have seen of the robot uh, navigating through the woods to a waypoint 500 feet away and turn around and comes back and I had dropped a, a straw hat on the starting point and it came back and came to stop exactly on that hat. Uh, yeah, and that's all just, to that is a magnetometer. Yeah, just to say something here, I think really the, the hallmark of a good IMU is the fact that it recognizes its gyro is pretty darn good. And so a local magnetic disturbance, let's say you're driving along, it, that should not affect a heading because it's because the magnetic disturbance is saying, whoa, we're turning, but the gyro is saying, no, no, no. So a good IMU, as you've seen, David, is gonna handle that. And I don't know what was going on with the BNO 55 with you, Jesse. I, I really feel like if it was done correctly, you shouldn't have to turn off the the, the magnetometer, even if your course is full of magnetic disturbances, but I, well, you know, I just speak out of not really. You should but, explain that for the ABC contest. It it takes place in less than a minute of runtime, so um, you know that's not much time at all for the gyros to to drift. And um, since you know you're starting heading very accurately, the magnetometer doesn't do anything for you. Uh, okay. Just not to suck too much time. What, what kind of drift, just to ask this random question, do you see like in a minute's time? Do you know how much your gyro drifts? Maybe a half a degree if la or less. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ron, not I just not even that. Just, I just followed that up by saying that uh, your description uh, of the gyros correcting for the magnetometer is only half the story because but what the magnetometer is really doing there is it's providing a long-term reference. The gyros uh, produce an accurate short-term reference, but if you try to integrate that to get a long-term reference, it drifts away. So the gyroscope drift, and the magnetometer <clears throat> provides a long-term reference to correct the drift of the gyro. Right, and it's the only absolute measurement of heading, really, that you have available to you. That's right. Yeah, okay. you, can, you can also get that through, through GPS as long as you're moving fast enough, that can also give you a heading. Yeah. That's right. That's what we do is uh, uh, we use uh, GPS, uh, the track that we've been traveling as a way to correct for any kind of IMU drift. So that it's a, it's a very primitive form of sensor fusion, um, but it works well enough. Um, sort of going back to the uh, uh, the autopilot question, I, I kind of liken it to um, uh, getting used to uh, um, you know, just using RC cars as a as a test platform to get used to outdoor motion, how, how it works. So I think it's I think you can learn some things from uh, Ardu Rover and Ardu Pilot and things like that. Um, not that I not that we actually use it, I and mean, we do want to uh, go a little bit deeper. But I'm also lazy, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I want a I want a functional sensor, damn it, um, and uh, um, so you know I'm I'm always looking for parts that that are already very very close in proximity um, to what we want. I would sort of go back to David and ask the re ask the question about um, uh, about the obstacle avoidance strategy, not so much from the stand of what's your strategy, but what do you practically know? Like I, I know that you have you've been able to weigh in on, on the, you know, the types of sens uh, sensors that are good for detecting bushes in your path, that kind of thing. Practical lessons. Well, um, you know, really that, that robot uh, only has three sensors. It has the, the sonar array, it has the IMU, and it has a bumper, uh, which is just uh, like Scott's bumper, just to tell you that you've touched the cone. And, uh, I have used those uh, sense comp uh, sensors for many years. I like them a lot. They're much, much, much more powerful than the little uh, ultrasonic $2 ones that we can buy in a bag from, from China for a dozen for 10 bucks. They're totally uh, different, it, yeah. Uh, it can see things outdoors that are important. Those little ones, for example, can't see chain link fences, whereas these can. Uh, as I said, they can see foliage. They can see cloth. They can see soft cloth. So that's a big deal. The particular strategy, uh, my robots use a, uh, a subsumption 
engine, and in that subsumption engine, there are uh, a low-level priority behavior that tries to steer the robot towards the waypoint. And basically, it just says if the waypoint is on the right, I turn right, and if it's on the left, turn left. And then the uh, higher level in that subsumption stack is a uh, avoidance behavior, uh, which is basically run by the sonar and says uh, turn away from detection. So since it's a higher priority, it turns you away from obstacles that are between you and the waypoint. And the, uh, the navigation behavior basically pulls you toward the waypoint. Uh, the other... <clears throat> The other sensor I have is a virtual sensor, which has turned out to be really cool. And basically what it does is I, I really am calculating odometry from the wheels, even though I'm not using it to calculate the location. I, I still keep those values. And if you compare the rate of change of the IMU versus the rate of change of the wheels, most of the time they should be about the same. Obviously, if you integrate them, they drift away from each other. But most of the time, they're about the same, you know, within, within some limit. So the sensor says, basically, if the wheels say that the robot is rotating, but the gyro, the IMU, says it is not rotating, then you have an error condition, and you're, you're caught or trapped or something, and it executes a behavior to, to get loose from that. I actually have a whole video of that, which is kind of fun. Um, which we can look at if you guys would be interested. Basically, what I did was I took all of the video that I had of the robot running around up in the Colorado Rockies, and I um, I removed uh, or I edited out all the sections where it got stuck and made a, a reel just of it getting stuck and getting unstuck. If you're going to have a robot that runs around outside, it's going to get stuck. And if you have to go over and it, then it's not an autonomous robot. For example, you won't get to do that when it's on Mars. Cool. Okay. Especially after its solar panels get coated with dust. Oh boy. <laughs> Kareem, did you did you have any other thoughts from uh, from your view, Kareem, on on those uh, the question six A set there? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to get uh, screen time. I'm just saying I got a I got a bail. Uh, oh, okay. Pre pretty shortly here. Okay. Uh, I have I have one more uh, virtual sensor that I could demonstrate, which basically is that uh, as you approach an orange cone with the camera, the camera will try to keep the orange cone centered in its image, and that means as you get closer, it will rotate down until when you're right on top of it, it's pointing down at a steep angle. So what I do is I use that angle to control the speed of the robot. So the robot slows down as the as the angle turns down. And I've got a little video here that demonstrates that if you guys would like to see. Let me see if I can find. Yes. Hang on a second. Did that do it? No, not yet. How about that? Oh, uh, there, you got a link in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just go to that link. What I did was uh, I've got just two cones set out in my front yard, and I was working on what happens when you get to the waypoint uh, and there is no cone there. Uh, and so what I've done is uh, if you get to the waypoint and there is no cone, it goes into a spiral search to try to find the cone. And you can see as it approaches the cone, you can see the camera uh, panning down. And as it pans down, that's, that's what slows down the robot. So it drives, the last few inches, it drives real slow until it gets a signal back from the bumper switch. Okay, cool. I think in the interest of time, I'll ask if we can uh, view that one offline. And uh, we're also coming up on two hours. Uh, and we still have a few more questions left. So uh, if people are still good, I propose to just uh, keep pressing on. Uh, although if you have to bail, uh, please do. Don't uh, don't feel like you have to stay around if you need to get going. Um, as it turns out, I think we have touched on a lot of the questions. What is going on with this? 
Screen that, was that was crazy. Okay, so I think we've touched on most of the questions on uh, on these anyhow, uh, without getting the details of custom messages or NEMA messages. But uh, so let's let's move on to the next group here, and this is just a kind of open ended, simple thing. Bill of materials. What are your favorite parts or brands? Why do you like them? We've already heard a lot about sensor suites, so unless, unless there's something there's... we haven't mentioned, we might might not need to go into that one. Did I just hear you say the word simple things? I, you know, I, not with this group, man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I might have misspoke. So favorite parts and brands, and why do you like them? What should we look at? Well, one of my favorite brands was Tanner, you know, but apparently they're not. Unfortunately, they're not around anymore. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think Kareem made the comment, I try to get something that's as close to what I'm looking for or, you know, what I need. Um, so I, I really wouldn't say I have a particular brand that I favor. Um, you know, Palu has a lot of good parts. You know, you, you find some vendors of, you know, where you can get things and get them shipped to you reliably. Um, you know, the robot store is always uh, has a real plethora of stuff, some really unusual um, stuff. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, those are about the only names I would drop. I'd be happy to, again, support the Rev uh, brand, uh, former member of DPRG, uh, founded it. It's uh, located here uh, in Addison or Carrollton, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, very happy with their parts. I don't think anybody else here in the group is using the kinds of systems that we're using, like with you know Android TV controllers and things like that. So it's probably not necessarily that relevant, um, but they've got high quality components and, and they're very flexible. And I, I recommend it as a, uh, as a way to get started a, a really good build system, even if you elect not to go with their, um, their control theme. Kareem, can you put that as a in the chat? Can you put a link or something? Yeah, I sure. And and I'll I'll stipulate also that that's uh, uh, basically a 12 volt. If you look at from the electronic standpoint, 12 volt system. Um, I, I understand the reasoning for 24 volts. It's also fewer parts that you're going to be able to find at 24 volts. You get the whole automotive automotive market building 12 volt type uh, motors and things and and controllers. Um, and uh, and that's just you know the the common voltage that we have. We, you know you can tune you can tune your performance to just about well a wide variety of voltages, I'd say. And I'll post. I would I would just throw in that my favorite parts are aluminum and Lexan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aluminum definitely. Yeah, aluminum. And uh. You can't see through my head, but if I move out of the way, there's a milling machine and a lathe down there at the other end of the at the other end of the room. So for RC car components, I really have been a fan of Traxxas, and it's not necessarily because of the best or the cheapest. The biggest component thing to me is five years from now, if you need a replacement part. Traxxas will likely still be making it, whereas with a lot of other manufacturers, once the line of RC vehicles is done, they no longer continue to make parts, and so it can be harder to find replacements down the road, whereas uh, Traxxas seems to be a good manufacturer of keeping those older parts available or having upgraded components that will work in its place. Whereas I see a lot of the other manufacturers, they just don't have the same components available. Um, I'm a big fan of the Teensy microcontroller because of the amount of libraries he provides. Um, it's a really diverse set of uh, libraries that are ready for you to use without any modifications. And the latest Teensy's can run a, as fast as 600 megahertz or even faster with over a mega RAM. So for a microcontroller, you got quite a bit of power available to you. And it works in the Arduino environment as well. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see, I think, uh, I think Kareem had to leave. 
Uh, David Anderson, you're holding something up. Well, this has to do with the camera, which is the sensor. This is a Kodak gray card. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, yes. Does. Okay. Uh, so when I take the robot outside, the first thing I do is calibrate the camera, the white levels and the, and the uh, contrast and so forth. And I use this gray card. However, what I did uh, a few years ago was I, la I mounted a gray card on top of the, of the sonar array. And the camera can see that by just looking down. So I don't actually have to carry the card around with me. Let's see if I can illustrate that. You see here on top of the sonar array is a gray card. And this camera can see that by looking down. Oops, like is under that. But, and this, you know, we could probably do a whole session on, on cameras and so forth, and it's really outside the scope of of what we're doing here, uh, but that's a, that's another sensor. So I add it to the sensor suite. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think Kareem had to leave. I was, we were very lucky to have him this much time. He was triple booked uh, today. Uh, on our next uh, grouping here, number eight of eleven or twelve, the most difficult thing. So what was the most difficult problem you had to overcome? What made it difficult? What did you try? What did you get to work? Most difficult thing. I can do that with an anecdote. There you go. Okay, Mike Hamilton that I built this rover with, Mike designed it and I built it. And Mike was an amazing designer and a, and a gifted machinist. So every time I made a part, I'm always sitting, you know, I'd make five or six of them and throw away half of them, trying to get the ones that were just perfect. And then I'd go back over to his house. He, he was dying at the time. And I would pull them. He'd say, did you make those parts I gave you last week? And I would say yes. And I would pull them out of my pocket and I would hand them to him. And he would look at them, you know, some little, and he would say, good job. And I would go, yes, success. If he didn't say good job, I'd know I had to do them over again. So um, I guess the result of that is that this, this machine is really above my competence level. Uh, I could never have built it without him designing it. Uh, I went to him and I said, I want to make a six-wheel robot that skid steer and has independent suspension. And that's as much as I told him. And he designed the whole thing from that, from that point forward. So I cheated. I got a good designer to actually do the design. And unfortunately, he's passed away, so I can't do that again. Yeah, so, okay, so that was your most difficult thing is getting a professional designer on staff, okay. And, and living up to his high standards, that was the hard part. <laughs> on the machining, okay, cool. I think, I think for me, the, the most difficult part with uh, the rover was understanding the the GPS tracking and coordinates and the mathematics involved and in, in calculating the heading and distance from one GPS coordinate to another. Um, a lot of David's algorithms and his equations are very, very helpful. Um, but there's a lot of, just like Jesse was saying, you know, I wanted to understand it. And it's not as intuitive as it would seem. Um, and, and, you know, I had to modify it somewhat. I'm, I'm not saying that your equations were wrong, David, but um, they didn't work for me. <laughs> so, um, but it was an excellent place to start. I don't know that I could have come up with that um, on my own. Maybe I could have with enough internet research, but, but understanding the mathematics um, for the GPS was, was certainly one of the hardest things and and I, my other comment would be, and you see it on our our email list all the time, um, the PID loops and how you tune them and and how you control them and what the problems are. Um, I think that's probably number two on the difficulty list. Um, just you know from my experience, but but I keep dragging around the same PID code from one robot to another. So, um, it, you know, you, you, like I said, 
don't in, reinvent the wheel. Um, if you have something that works, stick with it. Um, which I think again is why I'm more of a DIYer because I it's like, okay, I'm going to take this that I've already built and I'm going to add to it, or I'm going to modify it in some way that fits this platform better. Um, so, and I think I made the comment earlier, you know, built, robots aren't built, they evolve. Um, I don't know of anybody that's just put together a robot and said, okay, there it is. It's done. It works great. And I'm not going to make any changes to it. Um, I mean, if anybody has done that, you know, raise their hand because you, you'll be my hero. Um, so that, that may be one of the more difficult things too, is when do you stop? When do you, when do you stop tinkering with it? You know, Never and, do. Yeah. And, and if you ask my wife, you know, when do you stop spending money on it? So. <laughs> I, I would second that uh, as well as, uh, you know, when you're when you're solving a problem, any robot, not just these outdoor robots, but there's hardware and there's software and there's electronics. And uh, since uh, we have so many engineers in this group, uh, some people don't think of those as hard of problems as they appear to be to most humans. Scott makes his own controllers. So if he runs into a problem like I ran into last year where I don't have enough UARTs, to do what I need to do. He can fix that himself. He doesn't have to go online and start hunting around to see who has already fixed my problem for me, you know. Uh, those of us who are who are <clears throat> stuck with what we can find on the internet uh, have a different approach. Is Ron here? Yes, Ron's here. Unless you have a Ron around and you can go to Ron and say, Ron, can you make me a board that does this and this and this? And despite the fact that this man is the most busy man on the planet, he says yes. It's, it's an amazing thing. <laughs> Come on, David. I mean, let's be realistic. He's not real bright. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh. Oh. Hey, I am here. That's <laughs> a real brutal. Uh, he's recovering, too. Give him a break. <laughs> All right. Jesse, did you have any thoughts on that one? Most difficult? Yeah. To... Well... For me, it was just getting a rover running and getting the consistency out of it. Um, you know, I really just first started thinking about a rover about in 2009, but I didn't really start building it through 2011. And it was just getting the ambition and the energy to get to the point where I was ready to compete. And honestly, in 2014, when I went to the AVC, I drove to Colorado with a rover that didn't work. And it just so happened the day before a competition, looking through my code, I found a simple error where I wasn't translating the distance properly. Um, but it's, it's about consistency for me and motivation. Just getting motivated to work on it and getting it to the point where it's good enough to actually compete with it. Because you can sit and fuss with something forever and you say, oh, I'm never going to win, so you decide not to go. So at some point, you just have to say, I may not win, but I'm here just to try, you know, and, and I think people get stuck in their head that they only are willing to compete if they're going to win. But if somebody else doesn't show up, then maybe you'll win by default or it's a learning experience. So don't don't sell yourself short and really try. And and if you don't succeed, that's fine, because the experience will help you so much more than just necessarily going and not competing. Cool. Absolutely. I would second that. It's more important to participate than win, in my opinion. I think we heard that from David earlier, too, with this uh, DARPA challenge. Yep. The, the other analogy is everybody's a winner in the Special Olympics. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move on. Well, uh, I know this is, this is a, controversial, uh, a controversial viewpoint, and I've offered it before, but you know, it's possible to get motivated and build a robot that has nothing to do with a club robot contest. It is possible. Contests are not the only reason to build robots. Yes. But I think My, it's I, important that you have that, that goal and the objective in mind and that there's a deadline. To me, those are very motivating factors, right? I agree and, with the deadline. Because but, if you just build a robot just to be building a robot, and I've got several of them here, I never tend to finish them because 
it's like, okay, well, I played with it enough and, and I, you know, I'm not interested anymore. I'm going to fly over to the next bright light and, and mess with that. Right. So, so I have all these unfinished robots and the only ones I've ever really got working, I wouldn't call them finished are the ones that I had to bring to a contest. <laughs> so yeah, I, would, I would say my experience is the opposite of that. When I sat down uh, to build a, my first balancing robot, uh, there were no other balancing robots. There were no contests for balancing robots, and nobody told me when it works properly, this is how it should work. Uh, I was excited about it because I hadn't seen it done before. Um, and now there are, you know, there are a lot of them out there now, and they have contests and so forth. But if you let the contest control your design for a robot, you're letting somebody else's brain do your design. And this is what I was saying before. If 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 the contest fight, well, I've bitched about this for years. So yes. I'll stop. <laughs> well, well, let's let's carry on with that. That's I think in a way it's a good segue to the next question. Actually, I've uh, put it in the chat there, uh, and thanks, Ted's Ted's reinforced that the deadline is most important to finishing. So whether that uh, deadline comes from yourself or some contest. Um, so here's a question. So almost circling back towards helping. Uh, helping those of us that haven't done many of these get started. And uh, Harold found this cool looking uh, open source thing. Um, it's got six wheels. And the question I'd like to pose to our panelists is, what are your first thoughts about it? What looks good? What would concern you aside from the fact that it's somebody else's design uh, and it has Ross? <laughs> uh, what, what questions would you like, uh, would you ask to evaluate? And uh, before we go into those in depth, I'd say uh, for those that haven't seen that before, um, take a look at this little guy. Um, here's a little uh, video of it on some uh, kind of uh, rough surface. So it handles an obstacle much bigger than the wheels or as tall as the wheels. Um, you know, think about the idea that it's got GitHub repos and uh, wikis and a Discord community. So in a way it could be like the donkey car where you can start from somebody else's something and hack on it. Um, it's even got a decent uh, description of, well, it's got a full up, full up uh, uh, background to it on, uh, on GitHub. So, all right, so let me uh, park that and ask the panelists again. So what, are you, what, what looks good? What would concern you? What would you ask if you were thinking about it? I looked at it and my first concern was that you had to 3D print a lot of the parts and they were talking about a print time of a week. So you're going to spend a lot of time printing out all the components unless you can purchase them from somebody else. So that to me, that's a very, pretty big hurdle if you have a week's worth of printing to do before you can even do anything else. Yep. But, Hopefully there'll be somebody out there that you can get um, uh, three uh, printed parts from. Um, and as you said, Ross, um, Ross is not for a beginner. <laughs> Ross is uh, pretty unfriendly from a development standpoint if you're just getting started. It's got some overhead. Yeah. Hey, well, uh, yeah. I didn't want to call anybody out, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, Matt Drotter, I, I think I met you at Earth Day in Dallas, and um, it looks like you're the founder of Ross Agricultural, and you had an agricultural robot at Earth Day. And, um, I, I, you know, I thought the things that you were doing were very impressive, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear your input on this, since you, you've done a fair amount with Ross. Um, could you chime in? Hello. Um, I guess not. Matt, Matt's on mute. <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't mean to ding ding Ross at all by any means. It's just that uh, in our past discussions, the members on many of the members online have have uh, struggled with Ross. With Ross what do you mean have? How about is <laughs> is struggling? <laughs> if you won't use an autopilot because you don't know how it works. Using the algorithms in ROS, they're from all different parts of the world. 
I'm not talking about the ROS itself. I'm not talking about the protocols. I'm talking about the packages that are in ROS. You're going to find that to be a real obstacle to know what's going on too, because there are a lot of them are developed in universities. And I must, and original interest in the club was that this was a way to really leapfrog and do difficult and interesting things. But the problem that had is if it worked, it was great. But if it didn't work, you were screwed because you had no idea what was going on. Okay. So any other any other thoughts, sir? Can uh, aside from complexity of a of another build platform, any other thoughts on that particular project? Just at a glance, I mean, it's six wheels. It's got a similar structure. Uh, this one, it looks to me like the the wheels of can pivot. So unlike David's J bot, uh, the six wheels can uh, independently turn, at least on the corners. That looks just like the standard rocker bogey, like uh, from the Mars rovers. Yeah. Where the corner, corner holes can, can turn. Uh, if you're not familiar with the rocker bogey, there's lots of papers on them online. You can go read about them. But basically, for it to climb over an object, uh, the wheel that's going to climb over that has to come to a stop. That's basically what forces it to begin climbing. If you look at them carefully, you can see them do that. And uh, <clears throat> that's very robust. Uh, kind of platform, but it also guarantees that it has to move pretty slowly. Uh, you can't get much speed and still expect the rocker boogie to uh, to behave properly. Well, because so, the wheel hits something, has to stop. Interesting. Yeah, in, in order for the bogey to rotate. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Then we're. Uh... Second to last question, then. Um, this was a question that uh, uh, someone, I forget who, someone had asked in our Tuesday night session. Uh, and not, just to call out Jesse, uh, somebody was interested, Jesse, in, in the robot that you showed. You've shown some pictures and movies, uh, but can you show a little bit about the encoders on, on your robot? I unfortunately do not have any pictures available currently. Um, I, I'm hoping one of these uh, months to maybe do a more thorough presentation on my rover. I can provide a lot of details then. But what I can tell you is that on a lot of the Traxxas platforms, they are set up for telemetry. And one of the telemetry items is often um, engine RPM or the, the speed of the, the rover. So a lot of those vehicles have a built-in uh, telemetry sensor or you can upgrade them to have a telemetry sensor and it's usually just a hall effect sensor so you're able to just uh, plug that hall effect sensor into your rover and actually um, get the pulses just like the normal telemetry would in order to get the traveling speed the distance of your rover now what i did is the telemetry piece i boat i had only came with one magnet on it. So it sends one rotation. So what I did is I 3D printed a, a replacement piece that had three magnets instead of one. So I tripled my uh, resolution by adding two more magnets to the sensor setup. Um, on my bigger rovers, I just have a really big spur gear that's really open. And so I could just glue um, little square magnets to it and use again, a Hall effect sensor for that. Um, another couple of interesting things I've looked at, one is brushless motors. You can actually get for airplanes, you can get a RPM sensor for that. So it actually measures the pulses sent to the brushless motor. I used that at one time also as a encoder replacement. So I was actually able to just see the pulses sent to the motor and count them and know how, how much distance each pulse covered and therefore being able to know the distance traveled. I've seen some in some higher end um, rovers now that they're using the VSC, which is a open source uh, motor controller. And VSC has the option with uh, brushless motors of actually doing um, odometry with that. So it actually can internally keep track of the number of pulses it's sent to the motor and give you some accuracy then that way of knowing the distance you've traveled. 
So there are multiple approaches. Okay. Okay, cool. And then, uh, uh, Ted, thanks for adding that into the chat about uh, quadrature, a big improvement since they also give direction and, and don't get bad readings when they're stopped. Yeah. Uh, one thing about a quadrature also, it gives you like four times the resolution by only using two sensors. So normally a, in a quadrature, it gives you four times the resolution. So that that is definitely a big improvement with quadrature encoders. Now, in my case, I was always traveling forward. So I never really had to know when the rover was traveling backwards. And generally, if you're getting command the rover to, to go backwards, you're going to figure that your encoder account is going backwards. But uh, having a direction for it, uh, other circumstances is definitely a, a good thing for a quadrature. Carl, this may be uh, moderately off the topic, but following on of what Jesse said, I, I have for my helicopters uh, the Eagle Tree data loggers. Uh, which is a little tiny data logger about that big. It sits on the power lines coming from your battery, and it can record things like RPM and temperature and so forth. Uh, and it's real easy to use. If you use those DEANS connectors, it just plugs in where the DEANS connectors would normally plug in. But it's a really, really powerful little uh, data logger, and it will give you back things like I can tell you that JBOT normally consumes about 300 milliwatts, and that when it's turning uh, on a rough surface, that, that goes up... Um, I'm sorry, milliamps, 300 milliamps. That goes up to about three amps, and um, and you can track those things. So anyway, look it up, Eagle Tree. They're not very expensive, and it's a real nice uh, little data logger. You can learn all kinds of things about what your uh, uh, computer is doing, and uh, it logs. You know, those are, are cordless motors on the helicopters, and it logs the RPM exactly as Jesse described by uh, basically learning learning the RPM from the motor controller. That's the, actually what I was using was the Eagle Tree RPM sensor. So, but I was interfacing directly with that using using it directly rather than any telemetry system. Okay, cool. All right, and that brings us to uh, our eleven of tenth question, which is next steps. And uh, we've heard a lot about robots and, and panelists where you've got them so far. Uh, and we talked about how they're never really done. We keep adapting them. So could you each spend a minute or two and or three or whatever and, and talk about what are you going to do next with it? Where are you heading with these these things? David Anderson, hands up. Well, for, this is easy for me since I already, already mentioned it. The controller on JBot is a... Mini Robo Mines by uh, Mark Castelluccio. Uh, it's a 68332, a Motorola 68332, uh, which was for a long time my very favorite robot controller. One of the cool things about it is that it's got a coprocessor, a 16 channel coprocessor. It's a timer counter. It can do things like, uh, you know, decode quad encoders and hardware or generate PWM and so forth. Uh, I do notice that, that that seems to be a thing again now. People are trying to sell me microprocessors with some uh, FPGA or some little associated coprocessor that can be hardwired uh, to perform basic robotly functions. But my upgrade is to switch from that to uh, to the uh, ARM, to the SP uh, Nucleo uh, 32 uh, ARM processor. And I actually spent last year and I uh, ported all the code to that new processor. And I actually have to physically do it. And as I mentioned before, I, I, it's not just unplugging a CAN bus like Scott gets to do and plugging in another one. And the, the, the problem is the robot works now. And what I'm getting ready to do is to make it stop working probably for a long time. Further, when you work on an outdoor robot, you kind of have to work on it outdoors. I mean, it's hard to test uh, indoors. And so that's a weather-related kind of thing. A little too cold right now. Hey, well, my my next step with Burp is um, my obstacle avoidance. Like I said earlier, they um, I haven't really found an algorithm that that works well in a lot of situations. 
um, you know, versus very tight. Because one of the, my course here at home that I run, I have a, an area um, that's only about four or five feet wide and it's about 12 feet long. So it, my robot struggles getting through there. It kind of bounces back and forth. So I, that's what I, my plans with it next time I pick it up is to you know, work on the obstacle avoidance. Um, I'd like to see it be able to drive through doors and, um, you know, find the door opening and, and drive through it. So, so that, that's my next step. Cool. That's All right. you to yeah. or... Oh boy. I, I, where to start, um, on an overall basis, I'm looking at RTK, uh, GPS development for my rover code, um, obstacle avoidance using various LIDAR sensors, or I've even looked at like millwave uh, radar and some other things, but I have at least three platforms I'm looking at building right now. Last year I did an RC uh, riding mower. And so this year I'm going to look at doing a fully autonomous push mower. I also have a fully autonomous uh, go-kart go that I've started work on. I'm doing an electric uh, kids go-kart. So I, I, I have quite a full plate. And I'm also working on autonomous remote control tanks. So I have these little tanks that go around and you can play against them and try to win. Pretty, pretty inspiring. So I think those are some of the rest of us are just hoping to get like maybe one robot done. So, <laughs> yeah, several of those are two or three year. These are multi year projects. Um, the idea, though, is like with autonomous more and the go kart, the code builds on one another. So, everything I do for navigation on the mower, I can turn around and use it on the go kart. So, they're not really separate projects that way. Once the platforms are built, I'm hoping to just uh, leverage the same code base for all on all of them. Cool. All right. I, I have to say, I'm stunned at how clean Scott's workmanship is. It's pretty, isn't it? It's a work of art. How do you, how do, you do that? that? That's just amazing. I, I spent about 45 minutes this morning cleaning it off. <laughs> yeah, but the way the way it started this morning was already probably light years better than anything on my bench. But... I, I don't know about that. Because <laughs> now, now I have work, because I'm working from home, so I have work projects and my own projects. Um, but but see, unlike David, I have I have a whole shop outside, so this is just where I do coding. So I don't have my lathes or my mills or my materials in here. Um, I have the uh, luxury of of more space. So, but no, this is this is all just for TV. <laughs> it's the set. Very nice. Okay, well, those were our uh, moderator, uh, whatever gathered and organized questions. So at this point now, two and a half hours in, uh, we've touched on a lot of things and I seem to remember, so David, you had a list of points that you wanted to touch on earlier. Are those still relevant? And then- I, I, think, that, I, think we, I think we touched on all of them. We touched on them anyhow, how about that? Um, so then going around the table, are, are there any other open questions? We've covered a lot of territory. Uh, uh, let's see, Doug has raised his hand in chat. Well done. Doug, what does that mean? What, what do you have there? Uh, one of the questions I had for David was, David, how does your robot handle the compass calibration routine? How, what do you have to do with your robot to calibrate the compass? <clears throat> Standard calibration, basically what you do if you if you were to take your your IMU and rotate it to 360 degrees on any axis, but what you find was and, and plot the output it, is that it wouldn't be a circle. It would be an oblong. And, and normally when you do a calibration, what you're doing is the calibration routining is finding the min and max of that oblong. And uh, part of that will 
be determined by where you are. So, for example, the magnetic declination of your particular location will affect that. A part of it is the arrangement of uh, hard iron and soft iron on your robot itself that will tend to pull the magnetometer out of being uh, totally calibrated. Uh, with the, the IMU I use, uh, there's a process. Basically, you rotate the, the robot through 360 degrees on the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis. You do that as three separate things, and you do it a couple of times, and it finds, yeah, so, so you're going to do like this and like this and like this. And uh, and it will collect those minimum and max of those oblongs and store it in a uh, in an EEPROM. Uh, and I did that once years ago, and I've never done it again. Okay. As a matter yeah, of fact, I, I I make a confession here. When I added the camera to the robot, as long as the servos for the camera are in a fixed position, uh, everything works fine. But when that camera starts spanning back and forth, looking for the cone, it screws up the magnetometer. I need to come up with a different camera mount that doesn't have a, a motor with its magnetic fields rotating back and forth underneath the IMU. Okay, I was hoping that you had a better procedure than doing this number and this number and that number. Because that's how I had to do it on my, my on the rover that I had built. I had to do all three of them, but I never, you know, I almost always did it at every time I was at a competition. I mean, so, but you're saying you did it once and it was good enough and that was all you needed, pretty much. Yeah, and I probably need to do it again. Okay. All right. Doug, I um actually have a, it's just a compass, you know, just a regular compass, and I've mounted it um on an assembly that i i can mount it you know basically align it to the chassis so basically i know uh, several years ago we were talking about the different lines of, of uh declination you know as you move around from east to west right yeah, the lines yeah. are differently so instead of having like a software adjustment or something what i do is i just i mount my little piece of wood that has my compass mounted in it and i push it up against the chassis and then since this is just on a screw, you know, thread, I can just rotate the IMU until it lines up with the compass heading, right? And so that way I know that because since this is adjustable, it can get knocked around. Um, so that's how I, how I calibrate it. Um, I, like David, you know, I went through that process the one time um, and haven't found a need to change it or, you know, recalibrate it, because it'd be really difficult to do it now when it's on the robot. Yeah. It's got, there was a real clever way Kareem and his team were doing that. He talked to this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And basically, when they, they fire up their robot, they have it drive in a straight line for a short period of time, an arbitrary straight line. And while they're doing that, they're measuring the offset of the, of the compass. So basically, they use that as a kind of a calibration, uh, basically doing the same thing you're doing by physically rotating the thing. Uh, and because uh, it's exactly the problem, it can get off, and even off a little tiny bit uh, affects the yeah. behavior. Of the robot. Okay. okay, cool. Any other uh, questions? A quick question about battery life. What's what's the expected battery life during normal operations? There's a lot of factors that are going to impact that. You know, what, how much current your robot's pulling, what the capacity of the battery is. Um, just a lot of factors. Um, you know, I, I tend to oversize the battery so that I know it's not going to die in the middle of a contest. Um, you know, and I've run, I think, there's a 4,000 milliamp hour battery in this thing. And, um, you know, I've run it all day and not had any trouble um, with the battery dying. So um, that's kind of what I was wondering one hour or all day or anything like that. Is, 
You're saying a good stuff is bad at the other thing. Life. I like to be able to run four or five hours so I can take the robot down to the park and work with it all afternoon and not worry about. Uh, yeah. Well, I know I've, in, in testing here or even during a contest, right? I mean, you're making three or four runs, and so you're probably talking, you know, maybe an hour of run time or whatever it is. But I, I've I've run it more extensively in my backyard, um, you know, playing, you know, working on software, and I've run it all day and not had any problems with the battery dying. So I couldn't tell you honestly how long it would last because I've never run it till it was depleted. Buy a box of twenty this one <laughs> keep trading them out <laughs> yeah it's, it's not any one answer it all depends on your your battery size your motors and what you're doing i mean if you have a pi or if you have an nvidia nano it's going to make a big difference too. what what you're all doing with your rover for me if a rover runs for 30 minutes or an hour that's not all i really need and I'm using standard RC car batteries in them, but I'm running at a much slower speed. So that's how I can get what normally would last 10 minutes in an RC car. I can get an hour of it just because I'm running so slowly. So I'm not using very much power. I would just add to that that uh, exactly what your requirements are. Um, I like, as I say, I like to be able to you know, go out on a Saturday and work with the robot all day long and not have to worry about the battery. But I wanted to show, uh, this is a battery pack from my helicopter. And uh, that's a, a 4,000 milliamp hour, uh, 40 volt pack. And it flies the helicopter for about eight to 10 minutes. And uh, that, that's why I have a whole box full of them. Because when you go out to the flying field to go flying, you don't want to fly for eight to ten minutes and then pack up and go home. But you know we're we're drawing like 150 amps out of these things sometimes, so uh, it's very uh, it's a real it's a real pain to have to carry around and keep track of uh, and recharge a whole bunch of batteries. Uh, I'd almost prefer one that was less capable, uh, but that flew longer. Uh, so this is like the other end of that. You know, the other extreme from that. But being able to run all day long while you're working on it without having to stop and charging it is, is pretty handy. And also not having to have four hundred dollars worth of batteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just just waiting to catch fire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a uh, related, but uh, maybe David just said it. Sorry, I kind of zoned out for a second. But uh, I guess you guys would all agree, if you can make a battery pack that's easily exchangeable, boy, that's the sweetest thing ever. And really, with these lipos, you probably shouldn't have them left around, stuck in your robot anyway. Would you? Would you say that's the idea? I, I don't know. I leave mine in my robot and it's strapped in there pretty good. So swapping it out is, is a real headache. Um, you know, so I, I, I mean, I can see an advantage of being able to slip it in and out and just, you know, plug in a new battery like David's showing us there. But, um, yeah, I, I didn't take that approach. Well, yeah, I mean, the it's, other... It's, the other thing about removal of batteries is, is you can charge it in, say, like a lipo bag or something for safety. And also, if your battery does decide to detonate, it won't take out your rover. So I definitely think I agree. It's it's good, if at all possible, to have uh, easily swappable batteries. But whatever you do, mount them tightly because you don't want a battery to come out or slide around when you're navigating. I guess that's uh, particularly important if you're ramming into 55 gallon drums yeah. too. Huh? You want to be yeah. able to keep those batteries yes. stored somewhere in case you that's can. Why, that's <laughs> why I'm excited to go with these things. They're ROB and you can get the all the power tools are made to do yeah. fairly high current. They're fairly to be servers, fairly, uh, fairly high current, easy to service. A lot of safety stuff already built in them that I didn't have to worry about. I uh, make a mount where this thing slaps in because I 3D print it. And get it mounted up, and I can, I can, I got a boatload of chargers right over there that will uh, keep them charged up for me. So this is nice and easy to get to get through all that stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It seems like it's a new way for smaller rovers. I think it's really a slick way of doing it. Other than the cost, it, you know, you can get the, you know, an RC pack or uh, one for a, a, a drone, you know, a lot cheaper than the um, power tool batteries. Sure, but if you look around on eBay, and not eBay, but uh, Facebook, eBay, people are selling these things uh, sometimes 10 cents on the dollar because they couldn't get them to charge. And, you know, we're ingenuity. We could, uh, it's because the, the, the LiPos get unbalanced in here. And so you go in there and you bounce them back up and it charges just fine for a while. You know, it's not the greatest thing ever, but uh, yeah, there's lots of safety filters. Again, safety features built in that I don't worry about. And I don't mind doing the makey makey stuff every now and then because well, I, that's kind of what I do. So. <laughs> so that was all very interesting. Thanks for that feedback. One thing I didn't ask before was I've always thought, you know, a car, lead acid, 12 volt battery, they seem to last on the car for a long time, but they're heavy. Is, is the fact that they're heavy a bigger problem than some of the newer style batteries? I mean, are they, are they viable as a robot battery or is it a problem for their weight? Well, the, the weight to power density on a lead acid is, is very, very low. I mean, uh, um, even a nickel metal halide is probably, I don't know, eight, 10 times the weight, the power density. Um, and lipolys are even above that, right? So, and we were talking about earlier, you know, weight of the robot. And there's a couple of different, you know, philosophies. You know, you don't want to make it too heavy, but it's got to be heavy enough to get traction, right? So, um, and I think that's where the lead acids are, can really weigh you down, if you will, <laughs> to, you know, pun intended kind of thing. Um, so, you know, they're certainly easier to charge um, because you really don't have to worry too much about the charge rates or having a, you know, the proper charger algorithm for it. So um, in that sense, they're a lot easier to use, um, but they tend to be, you know, like I said, the power density, I, I, to me, is just uh, the, the deciding factor. And I think a lot of cases, car batteries are made to deliver, you know, very large currents for, you know, just the amount of time it takes to start your, your yeah. engine. And that could be in the, you know, the hundreds of amps. Um, yeah, there's, there's been some guys that have tested, like, you know, if you drove um, less current out of a battery, you know, what, what's the amp hour rating of like a, you know, a riding lawnmower battery versus a car battery and, um, the lawnmower batteries, I was a little disappointed. They're, they're only about 14 amp hours. Um, not very, not very much at all. So, um, you might be able to get, you know, a lot more out of a car battery, but then, you know, it weighs considerably more than any of the batteries that we would consider using on any of these platforms. So. Yeah. When you have a car battery, you're talking about something that's normally designed to have a very quick jolt and then it's generally just being charged most of the time because of your alternator so they're not really good at drawing a lot of current out of them repeatedly um as a rechargeable battery they don't make a lot of sense you have to look at something like a deep cell something designed for like a trolling motor or something which is designed for normal uh drain whereas a car battery is really not a good fit as a result, they won't last very long in use. Yeah, like old cranking amp reading. Right. So. I've used those little um, lead acid batteries on several robots, um, mm -hmm. like you might find in a small uh, UPS. And, uh, and I have to agree that all of the things considered, lead acid is the easiest to use. Uh, it's just the weight. The energy density is, is just overwhelming. But by SRO4 robot uses a lead acid battery. It's had the same one in it for about 12 years now, uh, and it still works fine. These are, you know, I'm pulling probably maybe 100 milliamps on that robot most of the time. Uh, but, the, you know, if you need a charger, you can run down to the auto parts store and get one. Walmart. 
Walmart has everything. I don't, <laughs> I don't use them anymore because they're just too heavy. They're just too heavy. Okay. Any other uh, questions? I have a question I'd like to ask Jesse. Uh, Jesse, your 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 rover is it two wheel uh, two wheel driven or is it four wheel driven? My my biggest one, the one fifth scale max, is actually two wheel drive. But in my smaller ones, I generally prefer four wheel drive. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hey. I would prefer four wheel drive in a one fifth scale, but there's not many available of the type I was really looking for. Maybe like a monster truck, but I wasn't really looking for that kind of platform. Cool. So Jesse, Jesse I assume that means they, they have differentials? Yes. Um, what I normally do on four wheel drive is I, I lock the differentials so that there's no slip. So if they have like a, a clutch or something in there, I usually remove them. But yes, they, they all have some type of differential in them. But okay. I, so the, the main trick when I'm driving is to try to keep my speed below the limit of where wheel, wheel slip becomes an issue. Mm. But I have driven even over dirt surfaces and the encoder air wasn't enough to, to prevent it from navigating the course. Cool. Hey, Jesse, how far along are you on your motorized push mower? Um, I, I bought an electric uh, push mower and I have the motors now mounted for it. And I'm looking at a power supply for the electric motor and the mower itself and i have the escs as well including one that i got through the line following competition so i'm hoping by mid summer to have it at least driving via remote control and start looking at more of the autonomous features like rtk gps but using all the rover code i have i'm hoping to have something functional this year still Cool. And I also want to have a functional go-kart this year as well. That might just be a remote control, though. So do you, do you have, like, nieces and nephews you're going to sit in that thing? and you know, drive around it, 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 It's not going to be safe for them. Oh, okay. All right. Especially if you run them into a giant orange barrel. Oh, yeah. The, the, the go-kart... The go kart is designed to compete against real racing go kart people. the The idea there is to be able to, not at the same time as them, but to do the same performance as them. Uh, I'm not confident enough to race them head to head currently. All right. Hey, well, I think uh, I think uh, I've been inspired. I hope, and I think everyone else. We still have 18 people in line. It's been pretty inspired. So how about a giant round of applause for David and Kareem and Scott and Jesse. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. For sharing hey, uh, your uh, thoughts and feedback. Carl, I, I did have one more question. Are we are we still going to keep the size restriction, the 18 inches by 18 inches? Of, of what, are you talking about the contest? Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. I think this this uh, this discussion today was more in line with the David Anderson thing of this really wasn't about the contest. So let's talk contests on another call. All right. So so what I'm hearing is you don't want to compete against J Rover Max. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. You've got a certain gauntlet there, Jesse. Actually, it's more <laughs> of a battering ram than a gauntlet, I'd say. Okay. Hey, well, thanks again, uh, everybody. Very cool. Look forward to uh, seeing some more rovers getting built and uh, meetings Tuesday nights and uh, next Saturday, next uh, in March. I wish you all a good, uh, safe weekend. Yes? I have a couple of questions uh, uh, once you end the recording. Okay.
I will end the recording now uh, and then we'll proceed. Where's the end button? There's too many screens here.